Your perfect meal for the weekend should be fresh, mahi-mahi blackened mm. on a perfectly fresh bun, mm-hmm. lettuce, tomato, onion, small little dollop of tartar sauce, not much needed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Old Bay fries fried to perfection, and a slap-your-face margarita on the rocks, no salt, at the current seafood counter my daughter's favorite restaurant. Yep, it's the current seafood counter in College Park. They also have a location in Henry's Depot up yep, in Sanford. In Sanford, but I rep the one right there in the like the Ivanhoe area. It's yeah. uh, or right up the street from that actually. You want great seafood? It's counter service, so yeah. it's super it's easy. Quick. It's casual, but the food is anything but casual. It's amazing: lobster rolls, fried shrimp, a uh, black and mahi Fritters, sandwich special yeah. of the day. They had. Yeah. I think we had some. Pasta there one time. Andrea's tried. Like, she's super adventurous, and she tries everything. I definitely yeah, yeah. am the old man. That I get the margarita uh, fish sandwich yeah. every time. <laughs> every time I get margarita fish sandwich. All right, you can't beat it. I can't. Uh, and they also have craft beers, the specialty craft beers from the Northeast. Yeah, some beers you're not going to get at yeah, other yeah. places around here. And like I said, they do have uh, liquor drinks, $7 wells. It's awesome. Yeah, craft I mean, cocktails. And they will slap your face. Yeah, so if you want delicious seafood, it's the current seafood counter in College Park. They are a watering hole. Yeah. And we have. Make sure you mention it that Mike, Mike is the manager and then Mike yep. Smith is the owner. And the, the, look for one of the mics or say, like, hey, are the mics here? Yeah, yeah. Say that I said that and just tell them that we told you to stop by there. They really do like that. They got Curtis Earth trivia on Mondays. They've got TVs in there for sports and for like other trivia games. And we've got multiple watering holes, of course. Uh, the Breeze, uh, oh, Whiskey yeah. Bar and Lounge in Kissimmee. In Kissimmee, great spot. Uh, also, Will's Pub, Dirty Laundry, Little Indies, right there if you want an awesome punk rock show and well, a really cool bar. Well, they got a lot bar. going on because yeah. it's uh, Fest is uh, this coming weekend. Yeah, so, right. I mean, you got a lot of bands that were playing pre-Fest. Salty Sisters, we've mentioned, and of course, our bars in Sanford Western Training Company in Celery City. Yep, that's Tom and Dan Wateringholes.com. Welcome to A Corporate Time with Tom and Dan. I'm Tom. I am Dan. Let's uh, get right into it. You want to get right into it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, buddy. Let's uh, play the song. Tom wanted to do a bit. He called it Weird Job Wednesday. Dan really likes it. Tom says that's bullshit. It's another Weird Job Wednesday. What are you doing? What is your job? Are you neat? Are you tidy? Or are you a fat slob? Do you make lots of money and you sit up in your tower looking down on all the people who are working by the hour? It's a weird job Wednesday. Just another weird job Wednesday. Oh yes, it's weird job Wednesday. Job Wednesday. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Weird Job Wednesday is brought to you by Jeff's Bagel Run. Hey, hold on. And, that uh, deserves a blast. <laughs> there we go. Co- coincidentally, we have the founder yeah, yeah. of Jeff's Bagel Run. We got him. Jeff Pereira. Hey, How hey. you doing, Jeff? I'm fantastic. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. Yeah, in today. thank you for being here, man. We appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. So, Jeff, you have an awesome story, and I love entrepreneurial stories. I love that you're a UCF guy. Uh, and I mean, the reason we have a segment called Weird Job Wednesday is truly because I think one of the the things that you and I do share is because we are a small business. We have a complete obsession with other small businesses. Yeah, yeah. We like talking to other small business owners. In fact, we're not really fun to go out with other small business <laughs> owners because we'll sit with them and then just talk about their business. And they're <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, yeah, yeah. So this environment is certainly better to be able to do that. But yeah, thanks for being here, man. Absolutely. So Jeff, tell us how Jeff's Bagel Run started uh, for all the listeners who don't know. Yeah, absolutely. In 2019, I lost my job. Okay. I was working in a corporate gig. And my wife, Danielle, was a stay-at-home mom. She had been home for about two years with our daughter, and then we had another baby. And um, after I lost my job, I called her up, and I said, hey, guess what happened today? <laughs> no, all right, oh, so, yeah. and, oh, my God. And 2019, best time to lose your do- job. <laughs> 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 it's like nothing is going to happen r- right after this. What's oh, coming next? Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> so I lost my job, and subsequently she actually was – being recruited back. She was ready to go back into the workforce, so she was being recruited back, and she was just 
Like, we got this. Don't worry. Okay. Um, so she actually landed the job first. God, how are women like that? My wife's like that. Uh, it's, like, I'm freaking out. She's like, what's fine? Everything is good. <laughs> yeah, you calm do down. That. I get a <laughs> She is the calm. She yeah. is the calm. And so when we had this overlap, we were driving from our house in Winter Garden all the way out to Winter Park to get bagels. And she's like, this is crazy. Is there anywhere? I wonder? And we had, we're pretty new to the area. We had left. We were here. And then we left. And we came back. So okay. anyway, um, we're like, we need a bagel. And she's like, why don't you make me one? Now, I'd never baked anything from scratch before in my life. I was always box brownies, you know, cut and break cookies. And she wasn't saying yeah. that in a negative way, right? No, because no. My, my wife's like, why don't you make me one? You know? <laughs> no. Would you make me one? She yeah. was looking out for my mental health. She thought I was going to lose my mind being a stay-at-home dad. And so she was like, do something with your time. Right on. It's a, it's a hobby. You'll figure it out. And Well, it became an obsession. I was <gasps> like, I need to get this right. And bagels are her favorite food. So... You have to understand when she's like, make me a bagel. I'm like, I'll do it. Absolutely. I love you. I love my That's wife. I want, I'll order, make you a bagel. Man. Yeah, yeah. When I, if someone said, make me a bagel, I'm like, I'm like, all right, I'll drive to the store. I'll buy bagels. <laughs> and and I'll put cream cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I don't what do you, from they, scratch? I don't even know how to do that. From yeah. scratch. So uh, it's, I like got on YouTube, started buying cookbooks, started looking at recipes, just trying to figure it out. Lots and lots of practice, lots of bad bagels. I mean, okay. Lots and lots of yeah. bad bagels. So can you explain real quick the process of making a bagel from scratch? Sure. It's five simple ingredients, flour, salt, water, malt, and yeast. Okay. And you mix them all together. You proof them overnight. So, you know, dough goes through that moment where it rises. Yeah. That, that infuses flavor. The yeast starts doing its thing. The bakery science starts to happen inside. And the next thing you know, poof, you've got bread, right? And yeah. so the bagels, though, you just form them into, into the little round disks and then yep. you... Put them in the fridge overnight. Next morning, you boil and bake them, and they're they're delicious. So okay. I think it's the boiling that I don't think people truly understand. One hundred percent. They like hear it. I know. I've heard a couple people like people do like this is one of your famous jokes. Like with veg- when people hear vegetarian chili, they're like, eh. It's like why yeah, are you yeah. saying ooh? It's vegetables in a pot. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they don't like, understand we, the boil. We, yeah, like, boil. boil eh. You know, it's like well, I don't understand that. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and what it does. Boiling bread is is very unusual. You're one hundred percent right. And most people are surprised by that. But but when you start that process by um, the baking process in that boil. So the bagels drop in the water, the outside kind of starts to create that crust. It's this like soft pliable crust. It's not hard like a baked good, but yes. it starts to bake essentially or starts to cook. And so that par cooking in the water helps to create a thick crust. Once you get that bagel into the oven and the dough starts to expand, it has nowhere to go because that crust is already formed. And so <sighs> The gluten, the sugar, all the stuff inside starts bouncing around in there and has nowhere to go. So if you think like a French baguette has like the slits on top, yes. and those slits on top let air out, and you open that baguette up and it's got holes inside of the sure. bread. It yeah. looks, it's airy, it's light. You know, you want to dip it in olive oil. Bagels, you break them open and it's like you can pull the dough out of the middle. You can make little balls. You can throw them at your friends. Like yeah. that stuff is tough, and so it happens that way. Because of that forming of the crust through the boiling process. Well, my my daughter happens to think that you're like Elvis Presley in Orlando. Like, seriously, <laughs> like, you're like the guy. She was very upset that she didn't get to skip school today to come and meet you. Oh. <laughs> um, she also wanted me to ask you, how do you get the bagel, though, in the center? That pillowy chewiness? Because the first thing we do, and I know this is kind of gross, the Dennis's, yeah. but when we go to Jeff's Bagel Run, we immediately grab a bagel, we open it up, and then we start touching the pillowiness. And we're like, <laughs> right, right, and we go, oh, and then we do do, it's kind of <laughs> gross, it is, with our hands. We don't, like, but we're touching them, and we're like, oh, we're like, oh, they're so pillowy. And Maisie will be like, oh, they're pillowy, more pillowy than they've ever been. Like, <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> She's like, these are the most pillowy. And we're just like <laughs> mushing. What is, like, how do you get them, like, nice and soft like that? I wish I had the. Like the answer, I just I mean trial and it, practice. It's, practice. I mean trial and error. Like, I mean I I had never baked anything in my life, so I made a lot of bad bagels. And when I finally landed on the recipe that you have in the stores today, I gave it to Danielle. I said, I think this is the bagel. This is the one. She's like, I've heard this before. This is not it. She came back. She you know she had, the overlap was over. She was working. It's months later. Yeah. She eats that bagel for the first time, and like she closes her eyes. She's like. I'm in my mom's station wagon. Like, I'm on Long Island. This is the bagel. This is the one. This yeah. is the flavor, the texture. This is everything I remember. Because you're being. shooting for Bega Mecca, right? Like, you're shooting for New York's, like, New York bagel. 100%. Like, yeah. And it's a lot of people are like, well, it's not the water. You don't have New York this and blah, 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 blah. And you don't, you know, you don't put the cream cheese on or you won't do It's It's about a flavor profile. It's about that. And it really comes down, I think, the secret ingredient really is the malt. The malt is the trick to making a delicious bagel, have that, like, authentic New York style yeah. taste uh, Montreal style bagels they use honey so it's a slightly different process they're a little bit sweeter okay um, 
And so they have that like sweetness on the outside, less of a savory, I don't know, earthy flavor. Montreal yeah. style. So this is what I'm super Never curious heard about. That before Montreal style. It I'm is, learning today is when uh, when you finally find the right recipe and your wife's like, "This is it, you found it," and then you're like, "Okay, how does that then transition into Ooh, a yeah. business?" Because for most people, they're like, "Oh, I, I figured out my own personal recipe, and we'll be making yeah. these delicious bagels I'll for life this, you know, for myself." Month, and my I'll family, you know, yeah. and that's it. But they don't yeah. go further. Like, I need to sell these. So, I just kept making them. First of all, you have to understand. Okay. Like, I mean, bagels are her kryptonite. So when they're on the counter, she's gonna eat it. It's like a candy jar <laughs> in an office. You walk, people walk by, and she's gonna grab a bagel, and she's like, "Listen, I gotta fit in my work clothes. You gotta stop making these." And I was like, "I like, I kind of like making them. I want to keep doing it. We want to have some in the house. I'm making three, four dozen at a time in the house. It's a lot Whoa, of bagels. Okay, that's yeah. a lot of bagels. It's a lot of bagels, yeah. and." She's like, well, why don't we give them to my friends? And so, like, her mom group that she was in, they start getting the bagels, and then some of these pa- families were like, we'd buy these from you. Dude, like, mom groups are the way into everything. Yeah, oh, they yeah. Are, you yeah. can get into a mom group, you they can are be a the billionaire. Key. Yeah. Wow, write this down. We need to get into mom, mom groups. Let's do yeah, some mom, mom yeah, content. I've, I've looked at that. Mom, I know moms. I, <laughs> I, I tell my wife, I'm like, I'm going to do a mom podcast. My wife's like, no one's going to listen to <laughs> <laughs> no moms are going to listen to your opinion on anything. <laughs> Two dads <laughs> on mom. <laughs> uh, so the moms are the key. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. they were the unlock. And you know, there's these these families were like, we'd buy these bagels from you. And I was like, no, you wouldn't. I'm like a stay at home dad. You're not going to come to my house and buy bagels. I've never baked anything in my life. You know, this is. They're like, no. They're like, no, we really would. So we took some time to think about it. We figured out like what rules we needed to have in place to bake from home, all the things. And then once we figured it out, we just decided let's go for it. We posted a menu on Facebook and Instagram and. I got like three orders. Okay, so yeah, uh, so, yeah. so now what are, timeline are we looking at? This uh, is now November of 2019. So I'd been baking bagels. I, I baked my first bagels on like September 25th of 2019. So it's it a few months. So uh, November 2019, you find your recipe. Uh, you start uh, selling small, small amounts uh, yeah. just to uh, friends, friends and family, and family yeah. mom. Your, you know your wife's mom group, and you're like, oh, okay, this is good. And you're like, all right, 2020. Maybe we'll get bigger. No. <laughs> like, well, let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah. A, a new year. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I got the whole world. It is world giving me a little anxiety. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It was. I mean, for a lot of people, that was a terrible time, right? Like, we yeah, know that course. was tough. But for, for our little small business that was starting up, it was like everybody's doom scrolling. And so they're like, oh, this guy's making bagels at his house. I love bagels. Let me hit him up. I get a DM. Next thing I know, I get another DM. Next thing I know, it's another and another and another. And before you know it, I've got like 200 messages in my inbox every time I post a menu. And Good I God. can't fulfill orders. And it came, I mean, it was bagels, yes, but it was also like me knocking on someone's door, dropping a bag of bagels and standing on the sidewalk saying like, hey, have a great day. And they're like, oh, it's so good to see you. I haven't seen anybody in like a week and a half. Right, you know? right. And so like it really became community and it became like a social interaction for people. And then, then and this like, is kind of where the name comes from, right? Just like, bagel run, yeah, yeah. Because, because you were was, delivering the bagels, yeah. who uh, delivering Correct. all the orders, yeah. and uh, I love that. And so then, I also love that the mascot looks like he's running for his life because <laughs> I'm coming. Cause he's I'm, terrified. Yeah, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm, I'm literally eat coming after him with my daughter. We're gonna eat the mascot. One hundred percent. I've always been a fan of barbecue restaurants where they have a pig with sunglasses and he's dancing in the fires. You know, like my sister has a rule that a barbecue restaurant's not good if it doesn't have a pig in the mascot. Yeah, yeah. And I feel it's the same not. for bagels. The bagel. Bagel needs to look t- like he's running from you. He's so delicious that you're going to get him. So was was it di- was the name different before you started delivering them, or was it always no? Like- it was just always just bagel run. I mean, think okay. about like I mean, if you think back to college, you did a beer run as yeah. we got older, yeah, yeah. and we you know Saturday mornings we're waking up, and even when we were living in South Florida, different places we've lived, it's like let's go on a bagel run. We'll run to the bagel shop, we get our bagels, we come back, and so there was always like a bagel run culture within our house, and then we just started bringing it to people. During COVID, I love that. Yeah. So, uh, when was like I guess the time where you said like, "Hey, we need to make this bigger. We need to turn this into a store." Yeah. Like, I mean, what, what was the, the hand mixed spreads, the coffee? The, for sure. Like, you've, there's so many components to it. Like, because you look at it and it is very simple, and that's why I think I love about your product is that oh the, yeah yeah the no toasting the whole like I like that it's a bagel. You cream cheese, great coffee. You know, good service. Simple. Yeah. Oh I, yeah yeah no uh, you do an unbelievable job making bagels and the spreads yeah. are, uh, fresh ingredients but it's a lot of spreads good and it looks like coffee. a lot of work and it's all done in house
house. So well, we'll get to the business yeah. model because it's technically a bakery, which is brilliant, by the way. <laughs> you yeah, know, like I, I, when, it, when I heard that, <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, that blew that my mind. Awesome. So then, what's uh, what's your first store? What, yeah. what, how's that? Work? So April, or excuse me, no, uh, we opened our first store in July of 2021. But uh, rewind earlier that year, that February, we um, we started doing some markets. The world was opening up, you know, and so we started doing these markets. They were local, um, kind of in some report in our neighborhood over nice. there in Winter Garden. And Mark got canceled. And the, the whatever, the event uh, uh, producer, director, whatever, she was like, I, we can't do the event. We don't have the insurance, whatever. Like, we're going to have to cancel. I was like, listen, why don't we just try to move the event, find a new spot? She's like, we can't move it. And I'm like, trust me, if we move it, people will come. Let's figure it out. We found the new spot. It happened to be in my neighborhood that I lived in. We did it, like, at our clubhouse in the parking lot. And it poured rain. Okay. I mean, poured rain. This is February of 2021. Gotcha. Poured rain. Um, everybody, everybody's packing up. Except our line, the people in line for the Bengals didn't leave. They just didn't get out of line. They just got soaking wet. They're standing in the rain, like, give me my (laughs) bag. And I'm talking like Florida thunderstorm, fronts coming through, sideways rain. We're in a puddle. We're like, we're soaking wet. We're protecting the Bengals with tarps. People are coming up to us and buying six bagels because we would only sell people six bagels because we didn't have enough to fulfill all the orders. So it was like, they would buy six bagels from us in the rain. I'm like I'm the honey guy with the, you know what I'm saying. I'm like, I'm like what the bagel guy has got all these buying my mustache wax. You know they packed, the bagel they, guy's they, got it. Uh, they all packed up and left. Yeah. We were sitting there selling bagels for about an hour in the rain. Uh, we got home and Danielle and I looked at each other like, look, we have a business. Like this is yeah. like people don't yeah, yeah. people don't stand in the rain for anything. Like. I'm not going to eat a pickle in the rain, but I'll eat a pickle in the rain. I will eat a warm bagel in the rain. In fact, I think my daughter and I have stood in the rain at the location near the subway in the Pizza Hut. Where's oh, yeah, that? College Park. College Park, yeah. 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 We have stood around that, because, you know, the line. Of, yeah, that yeah. corner. Yeah, before we got the one in uh, Winter Park. Yeah, yeah. So at our house, we had, like, five refrigerators in the garage. We were, like, because you had to refrigerate the bagels overnight, so we had them, like, stacked up on, like, beer cans. It was a mess. And, like, we gotta, like we've got to make this more legitimate. How do we get this into, like, a business? So we started looking for space. And we found a place, we put a lease offer in, didn't get it. Found another place, put a lease offer in, didn't get it. And we finally got a lease deal done in Okoe. That's where our first location was. Where, how wow. nervous were you guys? And like, be, I know you see the evidence of the people who love your product and stuff. But then uh, I'm sure you, everybody has doubts in the back of their mind. They're like, what if this is some, you know, what if I'm wrong? I go and, and right, invest right. all this time and money into opening up a shop. And then yeah. people, and then they just also get tired of it. That, I don't know what the world thinks of bagels. I know what. I do like because my family loves them, but you know, I don't know if people are like anti bagel or carbs. You know, like I don't know where For we sure. are, but I do know I love bagels. Yeah. So, like, how do you yeah, weigh that anxiety? I maybe? mean, it's terrifying because you know you're here. You are have this stable job with an income coming in. Every you have, you have bills to pay, a mortgage, all the stuff. And um, Danielle's like, you know, we'll just find a spot, and like I think if we find the right rent, we can make the numbers work. And you can just do the same thing you're doing. We'll just maybe hire you a helper, and it won't be in our house anymore. That'd be awesome if it wasn't at our house. And, like, people will just come pick up the bagels from you at this, like, location. And so we start doing that. Meanwhile, like, her job's getting, like, just worse and worse and worse. And, like, you know, it's just really hard for her. And, right. her, and so she's like, I hate my job. What do I do? And I'm like, quit. Let's go full bagel. Just quit. Come That's how I bagel. feel right now. I quit. hate my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh, it's, being here right now. <laughs> it's just because you're hungry right now. I'm making you hungry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm I'm the guy. I wish I made bagels. <laughs> I know it's there. Yeah, yeah. We're there. Uh, we're, yeah. I don't even know what yeah. we're giving people. <laughs> we're not, definitely not giving them delicious bagels. <laughs> Tom looks over. I'm yeah, wearing yeah. a chef hat. Yeah, we just gave him Ben Franklin. <laughs> I don't even know if they want that. Yeah, I don't think they wanted that. In fact, the one guy in the chat room said, I like Ross without the characters. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so so uh, you open up your first store, and then uh, is there a time where you're like, well, if people better come the first week, are you just promoting yourself through social media at this point? Is there it's all, any other Yeah, it's only, only social media, mostly Facebook, Instagram at this point. Okay. Um, Danielle ends up, we end up selling her house. She quits her job. Like, we go all in. Okay, yeah. so it's full. All, yeah, you're yeah. full invested. We're, we are fully invested. Full bagel. We're all in. I read that from the website. Yeah, yeah. Went full Danielle bagel. goes full bagel. Yeah. She um, And she's really like, she helped a ton from the house because, you know, during those COVID times and she was furloughed from her job, she was helping meet the operations. She really is the one who makes the bagel run run. I say that all the time. Without her, there's no bagel run. There's what it is today won't ex- wouldn't exist because I don't have that. Like, I don't have those talents or skills. I'm a very mo- I'm much more creative Danielle's person. Danielle's bagel run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She didn't want anything. She didn't want her name on it. She's like, no. 
Gotcha. Right there, so you're so the I, face. You're the guy. I'm I'm the face. I get to be. I'm the mascot. That's okay. cool. Though. <laughs> that is cool. So. It, it's. It, I think you need that yeah, in any do. business. Or For sure. Two people that do uh, and excel in two different uh, yeah. areas. Yeah. Of like the I'm video. the face of this show, yeah, and yeah, you're yeah, the. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'm behind the scenes. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I like my place. Uh, yeah, me anyway, too. the um. So uh, then you have your first store, and the, this is where uh it. it I, like I'm curious about where the expansion and the rapid expansion yeah. of your business. How uh, how does it go from there? First store because a lot of people would never leave the first right. store, and they're like, "Oh, this is my store," and this is you know, there's and, a certain comfortability once you get it there, and yeah, and, you, and it's seemingly oh, successful, and it's going well, and yeah. things are great, and you're paying your bills, and you're making money, and you're happy, and like, yeah, those are those are all very true. You're like, I I won. This is the like you know, I'm doing. This, this, yeah. uh, yes, exactly. I've won. I hit the jackpot. Yeah. I'm doing like. I'm doing what I want to do. And you and enjoy like, it, yeah. And, I, and you yeah. like it, you know. Right. It's, it was great. It was rewarding. It was fun. You know, people coming in. You got customers that you know. And then um, another baker in town called me up uh, probably January of 22, February 22. He said, listen, I'm closing my shop. i um, wondering if you might be interested in buying it. This okay. was our College Park location. And so I was immediately, yes. Danielle's like, no way. We can barely run one shop. What are you thinking? This is crazy. And then so finally she's like, well, let's do it. We buy a second shop. This expands our ability to get more bagels out into the world. Gotcha. And that was store number two. And store number two was hard. Like, yeah. I mean, hard, hard, hard. That's what I <laughs> so think. Store okay. number two is yes. what stops people from doing <laughs> yeah, so store number, number three. three. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you usually go back to one and you, like, no more two stores. Yeah. Well, we, we've we seen can it talk about that. that. We can talk about our buddy. I mean, okay. Porky's yeah, and, yeah. and Steve White, it, one of our favorite Bar- barbecue guys of all time. We still love that guy and his family. They're, they've always done us right. We love him. But he would tell us, he'd be like, he would do the, the expansion and do a second store. And he'd be like, like, oh, my Claremont. God. He, said, he told us, he's like, store number two almost killed me. Yeah. He's yeah. like, because... Literally had a heart attack. He's think, a, you know? Because he got go to store number two, and then to get there and be like, oh, and then you, you spend your time there, and then store number one starts, uh, you know, yeah. not number suffering, one needs help. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you're just bouncing back and forth, and then you, and a lot of people are like, well, this is not what yeah. I wanted. <laughs> you know? yeah. So how'd you push past that? So, I mean, it was very difficult, and yeah. I felt that same way, too. I mean, Danielle and I's relationship was strained. It was hard. I was running one store. She was running the other. It was difficult. Ooh. It was was not good, uh, but one person kept coming into the shop in College Park. His name is Min. He worked at an office over by uh, Mall of Millennia. He's like, you know, the office loves these bangles. You know, you really should meet my boss one day. I don't know. You guys maybe can do something. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, great, thanks, whatever. He'd come in the next day. He's like, oh, but seriously, we're buying more bangles. Let's go. This guy, Min, kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing. And he's like, let's get a meeting with my boss. Let's get a meeting with my boss. And finally, he's like, listen, my boss is the former founder of You Break, I Fix. We would love to talk to you about expanding your business. And Danielle's like, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm like, I know. I'm like, I don't know. We don't really want to do that. You know, two was hard. Can't imagine what more would be like, right? So <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I know. told you, this bagel shop's yeah. not for sale. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to say that to somebody. Even with the, the fake New York yeah. accent. Like, somebody walks in, I'm like, I told you, this podcast... It's not for sale. Yeah, yeah. For me, uh, I'd be surprised if someone wanted to buy this podcast. Oh, I'd be yeah. like, what? Yeah, well, you want to buy this? Yeah. Anything. Yeah. We'll take anything. Yeah, yeah. It's like one dollar. <laughs> yeah. And so then, uh, so you're... The, so you're, we take a meeting. Okay. You know, yeah. we... It's, take the meeting. It's, we take yeah, a meeting. It's January. We take the meeting. We start talking to him. And, you know, he's just a normal dude who created a business in his, you know, bedroom when he was at college. And, Whoa. and that was like, here's somebody who created something from nothing. And he's like, you guys created something from nothing pretty cool why don't we like work together and so we started working together and a year and a half later we've you know opened nine stores with number 10 opening next month hey oh, wow yeah, that's incredible mean, congratulations and that's so killer with Thank that you. partnership he was able to show you the most efficient way to open up other stores without uh you know a lot of that knowledge like you can't just look it up on google like you, you know yeah. it's like yeah, every yeah. business is different and i'm sure but uh there is like uh, a way to do it, and people that have been through it can guide you through it 100%. a lot easier. Oh, know? for sure. His, you know, he had a team of people that were working in his office already. You know, he's a designer. He's got an attorney. He's got all these people that know how to do things the and get things done. Yeah, the infrastructure was there. He also had this experience of building a business and growing it, and like he had the mistakes made already, right? So right, he yeah. hit the speed bumps. He hit the hurdles, and so we were the most sophisticated two shop bagel company in the world we laid the tracks and, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we're like now we're just on the train going yeah yeah, yeah. 100%. i mean yeah most people wait and then have to like 
I mean, we, we I, I see a lot of similarities even like in what we did when we were building out our business behind the scenes. We were still working our day jobs, so I get it. Like yeah. I, it, yeah, it also are... gives me anxiety <laughs> because I, like yeah. for some weird reason I live it again. You know, yeah, yeah. when I hear somebody oh, tell sure. the tale. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you also made the entire chat room super hungry. So we are selling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go by Jeff Bagel right yeah, 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 yeah. Go, folks. Yeah. Hashtag TD Bagel. When did you decide to add? Was there ever a decision? Like when did you decide to add like all the different types? of specialty cream cheese because yeah. that really does set you apart. That banana pudding cream oh, cheese. Oh, so my good. son was it talking is, about this this morning. Yeah, it is. You don't, I mean, I hate to even say this, but you don't even need a bagel with that. You were just like, start yeah. spooning it. And then I caught Maisie eating it with Nilla wafers. <laughs> Nilla wafers. Yeah. Nilla wafers in the mood. The mini 100%. Nilla wafers. And she's just eating it. I'm like, baby, like she's eating it. It's like the best dance snack in the world. She just took like, we had a little leftover it. Jeff's and yeah. then she took a bag of Nilla wafers to dance. I'm like, all right, Perfect. that's not bad. That's so, not a bad snack. So let's talk about the, uh, the all the different types of bagels, the spreads yeah, that you guys right. offer. It's a lot. And the fact that you don't overcomplicate, you know, there's certain uh, things that you do. Brilliant, by the way, that I'm uh, super impressed by. But, uh, uh, they, what caused you to go that direction? Was it over time you realized, like, this works, this doesn't? You know, when we started, when we moved into our first shop, it's like, the simpler the better for us. Because okay. it was Danielle and I. We were the only employees. I was baking every day. And then she was running the front of the house and doing, like, the counter service and handing people bagels. Like, we didn't even slice your bagel then. We, barely, we had one cream cheese plain. That was it. You know, okay. it was, like, very, very simple. And then people were like, oh, maybe you should get, like, a scallion or a chive or something. And we're like, oh, we could try that. And so... We started little bits and pieces, trying different things, and we hired one person, then we hired another, and so we got a little bit more efficient. We became more productive, and that helped us expand a little bit. Um, the bagel flavors, we always had like a standard 13 or 14 flavors, but the interesting thing was we had this bagel of the day. So it was this new flavor that we'd introduce every day, and for a long time it was just blueberry or jalapeno cheddar. That was it, because okay. I was the only person making the dough. you know, And like making all these different doughs just seemed like, I couldn't do it. You know, I was already coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning baking bagels. I'm not staying until 4 Ooh. or 5 o'clock in the night, yeah, like, yeah. rolling dough. I'm like, I can't do it anymore. So we had jalapeno and blueberry, and the jalapeno and blueberry just ended up becoming regular flavors that we always had, and other stuff came in. So we made, like, a French toast bagel, or we, like, recently just did a tomato grilled cheese bagel, which is, like, the sun-dried tomato dough with salt and cheddar cheese on top. And when you take that bite, it tastes just like you dipped your grilled cheese sandwich in tomato soup. And then it's just... It's fun to be creative and be thinking about yeah. new ways to make a bagel taste like something else. And, and the, your spreads, like there are real chives and real, yeah, 100%. real, 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 real fruits and vegetables in the spread, which yeah, is like the uh, veggie one, Andrea just so loves. high quality. And that, the hot sauce cream cheese is the oh, yeah, my that, family will eat so much hot sauce cream cheese. And Andrea mm-hmm. likes to take the vegetable and mix it with a hot sauce cream cheese, and that uh, that is a and that cream cheese has Jason's mom's Jason's mom's hot yeah. sauce. Yeah, we love that sauce. Another a, another local delicious. guy. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. And your coffee is. Let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They coffee did... is fantastic. So coffee is roasted here in Central Florida Winter Garden by Otis Coffee. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, I love this by the way too, where uh, you just basically locally sourced. Uh, we were neighbors. Okay. Glenn is uh, Glenn and Jacqueline own Otis Coffee. They were the. Founders of the company, they lived three doors down, an actual three doors down from our house on the same street on Mangrove Cove. And I was like, that's a breakfast block right there. She's walking their son, Carson, in the stroller, and she's like on Google Maps, just like looking around. She sees this little like pin for Jeff's Bagel Run, like in a house. She's like, what's Jeff's Bagel Run? So she clicks on it, she drills down, and she's like, Glenn, you should check out this guy. He's doing coffee or bagels. Like, you know, bagels and coffee go great together. Why don't you? So he hits me up on DM. He's like, hey, we should like talk about our side hustles we got going on over here. He's like, I do coffee. He's like, you do bagels. And so we met at the playground, the kids played. Next thing you know, we're like, you know, best friends. That's so, crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where so, modern day business deals are done yeah. at the playground. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, yeah. It used to be at the bar or some smoky yeah, yeah, bar. Now it's at the playground. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. Well, I'd be, that's you got a, a Stanley and your three kids running <laughs> yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, let's talk about the expansion because you guys are in different states uh, now. Yeah, and, we opened in North Carolina last month. Yeah. yeah and, I told my relatives that's my people are uh, Carolina people. So How crazy was that for you? Because like we're, we're not talking about the stuff that happened in the early 2000s like this is a couple years ago you know what i'm saying it's like quick. and Fast. so and so when you see a uh, jeff's bagel run in north carolina does it blow your mind you're like oh my i can't believe it's surreal yeah. you know i mean like i said like four years ago we were doing this out of our house like yeah. my home kitchen and so to have a store in north carolina to have other people interested in running our business and wanting to be a part of it is it's mind-blowing it's it's very surreal. It's like pinch yourself every day, kind of figure out 
is this real? I always like having people in here when they say, four years ago I was doing this out of my house, and then I think back and I'm like, 20 years ago, we were doing this out of my house. I'm like, hold on a second. Well, that, uh, uh, well there was uh, a time uh, four years uh, ago. Uh, we uh, did uh, 20 years ago, we were doing yeah, this out of my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can't franchise this <laughs> because there's only me and you. If we can get someone exactly the same as us, can't then we can put them everywhere. AI well, is trying. That yeah, is yeah really AI is trying. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, so so now what's the what's your future? What's your goals? Because uh, there are eight Central Florida locations, correct? correct? And uh, locations out of state, locations opening up uh, uh, southern Florida and uh, so uh, is there a, like a cap to this? Mm. Is that, because it, Oh you it mean like a, where, where, or, or is the sky's the limit? Just yeah, take it as big as you can make it. Because I did hear that when you open your North Carolina location there's a line out the door like, uh, it's like the, four hours long. Oh you the, can see the, the lo- photos. There's the, photos of it online. The, yeah. lo- the, which is obvious that there is a the, there's a market that wasn't being filled in, in, in this area that people are like oh this is an awesome bagel you know Right. Like, and so uh, this is obviously uh, something that no one's doing out there, and uh, and you know there's so many different places you could open. It seems like there yeah. could be hundreds of stores in the sure. future for sure. No, and you know I think our we don't have a top end goal. You know yeah. our, we're just like it's like one day at a time moving forward, and we are we are franchising. So the model is to franchise, which helps us expand a little quicker because it's you know other people's money right so they're taking the risk as the owner but that also gives them a ton of like there's skin in the game so they're going to yeah. be more committed to making sure that it works and like you know it's hard like running eight corporate stores in central florida is hard yeah, oh, know, yeah it yeah. is Definitely. so hard because you're trying to balance this like feeling of like this is at you know your local bagel shop but it's also like no, like a and eight, eight stores is a big company. Yeah, you that's know, big. and it's like it feels big, and it's hard to like get your arms around it. But when you're like a one store owner and you're franchising in Wake Forest or Raleigh, or you're going to be in South Florida, you know, you have this like this is mine, and yeah. then that same feeling that we, you know, Danielle and I have, and say this is ours. Other people are now taking that and saying this is ours, which feels I, really good. I love the like the franchise thing back in the day. Like when I was growing up, like I had a lot of friends whose parents were franchisees. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That my neighbor did, were rich. I mean, they did. What, but they, then somewhere along the line, I'm sure with all businesses, you know, things get messed up or what. But like I remember, like I had a friend that had a. I had one friend that did Bally. Like the health club? The fitness, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, Is that a know, franchise? Just stinking rich. Oh, yeah, it was a yeah. franchise. And then I had another guy that did Kentucky Fried Chickens, I think, at the time. My neighbor did 7-Elevens. Had like oh, three 7-Elevens. That's, the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one. And then he moved to where Dan Marino lives. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, man. He's got a big he, sculpture of a bagel in his front yard. <laughs> a big gold bagel. I remember he had the first Laserdisc. <laughs> and we were watching uh, Running Man on Laserdisc. And we're like, oh, my God. It'll this never is a be better than this. That's amazing. So, so let's talk. Because me and Daniel, honestly, when we uh, like, are oh, you going to tell them this? We're a huge fan this of Jeff Bezos. We, we, we were like, we should buy a Jeff <laughs> Bezos at that. that location. We're, like, we're going to buy what I'm like Stetson I mean, University in Deland. <laughs> so we're going to do. We're going to feed the kids. And, and because I'm feed like the Hatters. Because then, like going into some of the business part of it, uh, you guys are licensed as a bakery. Uh, so then there's, uh, you know, it's just a, it, it seems like a great franchise to own because because you're licensed as a bakery. We keep it simple. Less, yeah, for sure. Simple. You yeah, know? I mean, it's coffee, cream cheese, bagels, right? And, like, that's a very simple process. You know, you're not frying chicken. You're not doing all these other things. The bakery licensing is a um, it's a limitation, really. I mean, like, we can't make your sandwich. We can't prepare food for you. I can't do anything besides bake a bagel. I can slice it. Just like if you go to your Publix deli or your Publix bakery and she's like, hey, can you know, can you want your French loaf sliced or whatever? And you, they, they'll slice your bread for you, but... They're not going to make your sandwich. You know, yeah, the yeah. deli does that. That's yeah. a different. So we work yeah, it's as a, a different area. We operate yeah. as a retail bakery. It does limit some of the things that we can do in the store, but it also makes it a lot easier to operate. And so you have this ease of operation. You have a lot less stuff that you have to do. You know, you're still food safe. You're still licensed with you of know course. the health department. You have all these same regulations and rules. You're just not doing as many things. So it does make it a little bit more profitable because you're not buying all this extra stuff and trying to figure out how to make payroll and how all these things work. But, you know, you run it with less people. You have the opportunity to keep the product 
clean and simple and easy for your customers to understand. And it's it, like it makes it probably easy because of the franchise to standardize like the product. A thousand right? percent. Yeah. Everybody can do the same product. You get the 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 bagel you're getting in well, North Carolina is going to be uh, the exact yeah, same. Well, that's as important. You're though. I mean, probably apart. I'm sure to you the integrity 100%. of yeah, your yeah. creation. I mean. How many bad bagels did you bake to preserve that one great tasting recipe that, that you was, now have? I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. That was the biggest challenge of scaling is how do you get right. that recipe to be the same in every store? And, you know, I mean, bakeries have been doing this for years. You know, there's co-packers that will put ingredients together that are portioned per, you know, perfectly for you. So there's no mistakes. You don't have someone who's over-measuring one ingredient and under-measuring something else. And so all that stuff is very easy for the store teams to execute. It's, they put their little... Ingredient, pack it in, add the flour, add the water, done. Boom. Now, uh, now before we even started the show, uh, Jeff was showing us his custom bagel shoes. Yeah, uh, yeah bagel <laughs> shoes. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, These are amazing. Wanted, yeah. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we won't make it like half yeah. the show. That we can make him do calisthenics. Yeah, right. I don't have an OnlyFans. Yeah. So no yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sesame seed uh, yeah, sesame dunks. Seed ba- ba- like sesame dunks. Bagel yeah, yeah. dunks, yeah. And, Those are amazing. And so that, that got me thinking about, have you been introduced with other... A big bagel. Uh, is there other yeah. like is like oh like as I'm sure that you shook up the bagel world you did. and then yeah. so the other people I'm are sure like who's this Jeff? Yeah. What is he doing? Yeah. And then it's like oh this, this guy the uh, Jeff's yeah. making some uh, waves in the bagel world. Yeah. And uh, so have you had to deal with like any Ever, sort of you wake big up business find some cream cheese <laughs> on your doorstep or something? You yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. I haven't woken up to like a bagel head on my bed. Yeah. What a cinnamon raisin in his bed? What happened there? Um, you know we um. I think we are disrupting a little bit. Mm. You know, most bagel shops today, which is, it seems silly to like, most disruptions is about streamlining, making it more efficient, making it easier. We've kind of done the opposite of that. A lot of bagel shops that you go to today are a frozen product that comes in that's like just reheated in the store. They toast it up, make a sandwich, do something, maybe serve it to you in a bag, whatever. Um, we're like going backwards. We're like, let's make it from scratch. Let's do it the hard way, the old fashioned way in the store, but that's going to make it better tastier, yeah. fresher product. Like, we're really invested in that. I've um, never got one not warm in the bag. There's always going to be at least one warm one, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I've yeah, never yeah, not sure. gotten warm well, bagel. Like, I mean, I'm sure you can get, you know, bagels that are still fresh, yeah. but they're not piping yeah. hot. But I always get warm ones. But it's also the brilliance of what you're doing is like, hey, we're making an insanely good bagel and, uh, and spread. And that's and and we have good coffee, and that's it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And we're not doing something where like well, you, you want some, you want a half a steak it, on this. Uh, you're like steak. I mean, you're cooking steak back there. Some people <laughs> hate this. <laughs> yeah, it's like why are you, oh, it's too much. Well, it's, it's, some people hate this, but it's like the cheesecake factory, right? It's yeah. like the Gordon Ramsay used to always yell about like your too- menu's so <laughs> big. He's like, God, yeah, what too are big. you doing? Yeah, I mean. I don't know if even you and I could handle bagel spread and coffee. We can handle <laughs> bagels and spread. Yeah, 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 you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. three things really, really good is still very hard to do. It is, and especially executed. with sprinkle and uh, and then what's the one with salt and then Asiago and then um, oh that. Uh, the, the onion? Abbey? Oh, the Abbey. The yeah. Abbey. The Abbey. Have you had, the yeah. Abbey. That's the the Abbey is a, it's a salt, onion, and Asiago cheese bagel. I used to make it at home. My oldest daughter loved it, and then she went off to college. She'd visit us in the shop, and she's like, hey, we make that bagel I used to make at home. And so I'd make it for her, and then my team was like, hey, what are you doing over there? And I'm like, oh, I made this bagel. And then they started asking me to make oh, the good. Abbey bagel. And so customers are, of course, like watching the team eat this bagel. They're like, what is that? I'm like, oh, it's a salt, onion, Asiago bagel. Like, that'd be really good. Can we make that? And so it got into the bagel of the day rotation. And now it's like probably like the second, maybe first most popular it's, bagel of the day. It's, it's a de- cool. it's a deadly bagel. It's, like, so it's a good. really it's like good French onion bagel. soup in a bagel. Yeah, it's ridiculous. That it's so bagel, good. I get that with hot sauce because oh, I'm always so with the hot sauce cream cheese. Mm. And then now I get uh, now I did, this is the boringest thing I order, but plain with uh, banana. Plain with the banana pudding. Now, the banana pudding is Danielle's recipe, too. It's so good. God, the banana pudding cream cheese is ridiculous. Frosted it, cake with it. it, mm. it if, I'm imagining if I had Tom's bagel run, and then my kids were like, make me a bagel. I'm like, go to the store. <laughs> 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 Down the street, there's eight locations. So do you still make bagels at home? We do not make them at home. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 gotta get it out of the house. No more bagels yeah. at home. It all takes place in the shops. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll you you know, we just like This morning, I door dashed some to the house. Cause no, <laughs> there, that, 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 I knew it. That, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Them. That's yeah. awesome. So, Jeff, uh, it's been a pleasure talking Man, to you. It's right? been so, so much fun. fun. I do, I, should I apologize to him now for the song? 
Should I, I do it? Song, you okay. Did you like the song? The song was awesome. Okay, I thought it was too aggressive. Hold on, I'll play a little play bit. Play a little bit, yeah. Okay, I'll play a little bit for so, everybody. Oh, it's boy, never toasting. Just beg a one, they got the most, kid. Just beg a one, you gotta get you some. Just beg a one, it's the best, son. Yo, what's the best of the day? Yeah, right? Like, what's yeah, the bagel? It's too much. It's, too much. <laughs> it is, it's a little aggressive. It's a little aggressive. <laughs> so I did another one for you because okay. oh, I didn't oh. feel... Con- I, okay, do you like Yacht Rock at all? Sure. Okay, exactly. I'm just going... Okay, I did... I did. This one is like more of like a Yacht Rock style. Right. I thought you would like this one maybe better. This one's groovier. <laughs> And, little... and this is like more of, I think, a Jeff's vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead yeah, yeah. of the other one, which was very aggressive oh, and like yeah. almost gangster this is, rap. This is like front of house, the other one was back of house. Yeah, Correct. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Start your morning. Oh, yeah. Off Without a dress, big run. I love this. Big so good. And cream cheese. Oh, yeah. Have another if you please. <laughs> it's smooth. the music video <laughs> yeah that one's good we need the music video for this this definitely. one this one's like 70s early 80s Girl. yacht rock you're out on it's the good. yacht you gotta <laughs> you've got uh you've only got three things on your boat you've got shrimp cocktail okay. white wine and jeff's bakes <laughs> so, uh, that's good that's, that's all you have right, and you're you sailing out to, right <laughs> you're sailing out to meet christopher cross for some bagels all right uh, that that's awesome. Um, well, Jeff, uh, congratulations on all yeah. your success. Please give Danielle some love from us. Thank Absolutely. you so much for the Absolutely. product. And uh, Is, did they ever invite you uh, to UCF to do any speeches uh, for the uh, young entrepreneurs at yeah. uh, UCF? Uh, I think yeah. So last year we talked with um, the uh, yes. Okay. Like, there yeah. was a group, the business, in the business. In we the business did that. School. They yeah. asked we, us to leave. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did it one time and never talked to yeah, us yeah. again. In fact, they, they we've only it. done it one time as well. To make sure they better. We, 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 we did it, and I think at one point I looked, and we had like twenty minutes left, and the lady was like. That's our time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We started going into uh, things that were like, this is not what we wanted. Like, you don't know anything yeah. about the business? <laughs> I'm like, we started, yeah, I had put jokes, my leg up on a stump. I'm like, let me tell you what's wrong with the government. Like, uh-oh, uh-oh. All right, well, let's get out of thanks, here. Thanks, Jeff. Again, Thank you. Uh, when you go by Jeff's yes. Bagel Run. Get the app. Use the app. Yeah, you, it, you, it shows you like real time what's going on in the store. Yeah, so. your, your app is great, by the way. Thank you. Um, yeah. and, uh, it's so, way better than, uh, 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 we're, we've been told that ours is a, is, I can't even say what it is. <laughs> it's not good, though. I'll say it's not good. Um, but use a hashtag TD Bagel that lets us know yeah, uh, that you went by, and that's important to the relationship. But we're happy to uh, have you guys as a sponsor, yeah, and awesome. we're super excited to just work with you and uh, obviously talk about an awesome product. Like when uh, when I knew you were coming on board, I was like, this is awesome and very easy for us just to tell yeah. our audience, like, these are awesome bagels, uh, and they do an awesome job. Well, as a small business, it's very fun for us to talk about small businesses that actually succeed. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, there that's you awesome. Go. All right, uh, we will see you guys tomorrow. Welcome to A Corporate Time with Tom and Dan. I'm Tom. I am Dan. We are live on Twitch and YouTube right now. And you can watch us because podcasts are watchable now. And our guest, our, our guest that's up next, he actually has a really good watchable podcast. You can find us, though, at, at Tom and Dan Live. Well, our guest is going to be at Hard Rock Live on Friday, October 25th at 8 p.m. Yes. Uh, you can go to uh, hardrocklive.com and get your tickets. Yes, you can. Uh, I urge you to do so. On the line with us, uh, Felipe Esparza. How you doing, Felipe? What's up, fool? How are you guys, man? Long time no see. I yeah. know, yeah. We were just talking about the last time you were in uh, the studio. I think it was pre-pandemic. Um uh, is the last time I we had so. you in. We yeah. had, and we talked to you a couple times. Uh, how you been? I've been great, man. The last time I was there, I was at your house with that comedian uh, Adam Murray. Yeah, oh, we, we yeah. did the house. Yeah, you did you did do our house, and then you did one time at our new studio. But at the house, yeah, every time my it's still in my wife's home. My, that is now my wife's home office. So I'll have you know that oh. every time she goes to use the restroom, it says "What up, fool?" right above her head. Is she going to the bathroom? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I remember when uh, when I saw your cool um, studio, I told my wife I want a studio like that with all the plugs on the couch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gotta, yeah. You gotta have the plugs. You gotta have the wires. Everything. You gotta have the oh, perfect, man. The sound, everything. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. We appreciate it. Hey, and congrats 
on the brand new tour. You're coming through Orlando. You're coming back here. But is is it correct in me saying that this is the first time that later this year you will be taking yourself overseas? You'll be going across the pond, as it will, to New Zealand, Australia, and maybe some other places. This is truly the first yes, time. I'm going to London, Amsterdam, and, and um, Dublin, Ireland. Oh, nice. and you've never been to Europe? You've never taken a tour over there? I've never done shows in England or Dublin, but I did a show many years ago in uh, Rotterdam, Netherlands, which is like 60 minutes from Amsterdam. I did a television show there, like a talk show. Okay. Like a letterman. It was called Ray Martin Lott. It was Raymond is late. Late night with Raymond, and it was a Dutch show. And all the only segment of English. It was a long time ago. The Dutch, they love their late night shows. I remember Tom Rhodes, comedian Tom Rhodes, had a, a Danish uh, night show. He hates us, though, now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Why would you bring that up? Well, it's just true. It's, it's, it's true. He doesn't like us very much. It's not our fault. So, uh, Felipe, uh, you, uh, you... I don't know why. You got both feet. <laughs> <laughs> you just uh, celebrated 10 years of your podcast, or both your podcasts, Yeah, actually. congratulations, man. Yeah, man, we hit our, um, I don't know if it was 300 or 400 episodes, I'm not sure, or 500, I don't know. I yeah, it's, I think you did, I think it was 400. You know, I mean, 400 to anything is phenomenal, but, I mean, to do 10 years, when you frame it like that, like, you've had a podcast for 10 years successfully, Why do you, what do you account the, the success to? What, what, what makes it so successful? Because you were doing it before anybody else was, really. Yeah, because we wanted something to do. We wanted our fans to have something now besides stand-up, because I figure, you know, I don't have a television show. Sure. So I've got to keep these people... It, I'm going to keep myself in their mind while I'm not in their town. So I just started a podcast. And it's been doing great. We started out with just a recorder with bad sound for like seven episodes. Then the sound got better. And then we moved into a studio and then it got really better. Yeah, I mean, and you guys still run it live. I mean, I was on there earlier today watching some of the episodes on YouTube. Like, is there a reason you choose to do it live? Like, we run ours live, and I enjoy that. But, like, do you like the energy level that way? Or, like, it's pretty cool that you guys do that. I think I like it more because uh, there's fans who log in every week, and they have their own world and their own conversation within the podcast. Yeah, the chat room is they're chatting about stuff that's something not related to what we're talking about. So they have their own view, their own world. So there's people who just communicate with each other on the on our chat room during our podcast. So they greet each other. Hey man, how you doing, man? What's up? How, how's the family? And they have their own conversation. So I keep it for the fans. They yeah. The world. See, here's where me and they, you differ, Felipe. <laughs> They're commenting and they're hating on everything. Oh man, the sound looks bad today, or his voice doesn't sound good today, or what's so with that that roach in the wall? They notice everything. No, I know. Well, yeah. that, see, that's the difference between me and you, Felipe. Is I dislike the chat room <laughs> because <laughs> all they do is make fun of me, Felipe. Yeah, he does get made fun and, of a and, lot. And then so then I'm like, well, what? Do, are you here just to bully me? And uh, and then then they'll be having their own conversation. They're not even paying attention to the show. Yeah. <laughs> they're doing that right <laughs> now. They're not. They're not. They're watching the listening to the they're chatting. And watching some other stuff like a movie or a show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, well, why are you even here then? I thought you guys were here because of us. <laughs> and you're uh, just having, you're, you're making your own friends. I, I feel like you should sit quietly yeah, and listen feel, to our show. Uh, you, so you feel an obligation now to can keep it going because you've linked these people together and now they're friends. Yeah. Now, I heard one of the chats somebody said about me, oh man, I hate this podcast. But I, but I like to eat the stand up and I want him to have the views. <laughs> I like, I like you, buddy. <laughs> See, that's why I don't like the chat room. I like the idea of you just doing your podcast for so long just to keep the chat room for, together. That's kind of what we're doing, too. I mean, if you really think about it, I think we're doing the same thing that Felipe is doing. Uh, that's crazy, man. Uh, hey, tell us a little bit about, I, I had heard that earlier this year, I think it was earlier this year, didn't you go out on Burt's Fully Loaded Cruise? 
Yes, I did. What did you think? Of, like, what did you think of that? I mean, like, you've always been kind to us. You're a super successful comedian, but you see guys like Bert putting together these mega tours and then bringing you guys along. Like, what's that like? Is it as crazy as it looks? Oh, it's crazy, bro. <laughs> Man, the first time I went out with them, it was Bert Kreischer, uh, fully loaded with Mark Norman and uh, Big J Okerson, yeah, and so many other comedians. The trash. The trash bag podcast guy, and man, um, Mrs. Pat, Miss Pat. Oh wow! We had a, a, a as soon as we got in the ship, they said hello to everyone, and we had a speedo contest with a bunch of men, and that speedo contest turned into the smallest man contest immediately. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Immediately, some guy put the speedos down, and he has the smallest member. Of the Jackson Five, yeah, I mean, yeah. This guy was this guy was small, bro, like tiny. And um, uh, Bert Crasher said, "Can anybody beat that? Five thousand dollars, you can beat the size of this man's penis, right?" And it was smaller than that, man. Can you? Can you is anybody smaller than that? And I remember, I was like, I was trying to find somebody that that wants to challenge this guy, and it was a woman. She was rubbing her husband's shoulders, trying to pump him up. And I remember her saying, Ryan, you got this, honey, you got this. (laughs) 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 And he went up there, bro. And like a shot, bro, he won, bro. Like, like, wow, bro. Like, that was the smallest penis I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) (laughs) And and it had four skins, so I made it extra small, you know? (laughs) I have that. That is me. You're describing me. (laughs) Big Chick Okerson said that, and the guy had a big scar on his stomach. Big Chick Okerson said, man, I wonder what the size of it was before he got hit with an axe on his chest. (laughs) <laughs> well, this guy looked like he survived a uh, barbarian execution. <laughs> well, uh, so this is how you started the fully loaded cruise you know, with Bert Kreischer. Okay, think about it, man. We're not even three hours into the trip, and this guy, these two guys are really showing up the smallest penis on the boat. I mean... You can still see Miami from our boat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be remembered as the winner of that contest for the next six days. <laughs> We're, we're, Again, I'd like to remind everybody, yeah. too, Felipe as far as is going to be at the I Hard learned, Rock. I learned a lot of things about sexual relationships with marriage people. There was a lot of swingers on the ship, and I didn't know about the pineapple stuff, you know? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah, 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 the pineapple. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Because there were some couples that were not that good looking, you know, but they were really dressed with pineapple stuff. And I felt bad for them because they're both not good looking. So they're getting being turned down by other couples. The uh, the swinger group is they interesting yeah. because um, they are normal. Yeah, they which are normal. It's always well, off like vampires. I feel like they, want, <laughs> yeah. they always want new people to come in. I would like for them to act like they're swingers, and I don't like the fact that they just act like they're normal people. Right. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then they do this abnormal thing. I want them to kind of dance around <laughs> to let me know who they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I need them to be more sexual or something. I, I hate the fact that they're like, oh, oh, you swing? <laughs> you let the uh, other people bang your wife, and then you get to bang their wife? Yeah. So there uh-huh. was some of that going on on, the, on that boat as well, Felipe? I'm pretty sure they won't follow the environment, man. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> I never get invited my, either. That's my nightmare. Yeah. That's my nightmare that my wife and I get invited, and then I, I fit in before everybody, then I got to watch my wife be a whore for the next three hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I know. Yeah, that's, uh, that is how it works. works. Yeah, that is well, exactly how it works. You know what it is now? Some of the doors had pineapples, <laughs> and some of the doors had um, a way to tell you what type of um, swing you're in. Yeah, like soft swinging, hard full swap. Yes. Yeah, they yeah. have um, they use the uh, uh, loofah. Yeah, they use like the, the color of the loofah describes what type of swinger they are. Yeah, yeah. Like if it's a, like if it says a certain color, that means they swap wives. And uh, another one, they swap husbands. Like husbands go at it, you know. And then they have another one that um, 
Swap daughters. Oh, I've seen the videos yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I subscribe to that. <laughs> yeah, the guy's like in his late, he's 55, hot, and he has like a 30 year old daughter who's hot, and they're both trading daughters, bro. Oh, I'm for that. <laughs> <laughs> Not with my daughter, but I just, if you want that to do is that. Odd, yeah, that is <laughs> odd. That's an odd cruise. <laughs> what do you tell the mom? Well, I'm, I'm taking my daughter to cruise. Bro, I wouldn't mind doing that if my daughter came with other scales, too. Like, oh, really? Your daughter can uh, change your roof. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Oh, your son comes with... Uh, with mechanical skills, he's not just stuck inside a dryer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Felipe, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to we us again. We appreciate you, man. Hard Rock Live, it's Friday, October 25th. Get your tickets. The show starts at 8 p.m. Felipe is always hilarious. Yeah. Uh, don't miss it. Hard Rock Live is a great venue. And go Dodgers, man. I know you're going to be excited. Go and Dodgers. Go Dodgers. Rest, rest in peace. Yes, that, El Toro. Yeah, we got to give him some love. Yeah, man. Uh, also, man, uh, what happened to your sidekick, the guy that throws out the funny line next to you guys? Um, all of our employees quit. Yeah, all of our employees quit. <laughs> they, they quit yeah, on yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that happens sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was one uh, dead pan comedian that was a black hair, very funny. Uh, yeah, we tried. Uh, the, the, it was a man or a woman? A man. No, we about oh, Ross. Ross. Yeah, yeah, Ross. He still comes he around. He still comes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, funny, yeah. man. That guy's funny. He still yeah. likes it. Remember, we'll... I remember that your couches were beige or gold or brown. Yeah. Red. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, no, they were. They were oh, gold. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, were gold. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. He's right. He's got. A, you got a good memory, man. Well, hey, and we're glad. Room, we're glad you're coming back. Area. And we appreciate you, you know, stopping at Hard Rock and and anytime you're in town, man. If you got time for us, we appreciate it. Okay. Oh, appreciate it, man. We're going to go back and get that studio. Yes, sir. All right, Felipe. Take it easy, dude. All right, man. Later, man. Take care. See See ya. ya. That is Felipe Esparza, live from... uh, I don't don't know where where he's at. So, full disclosure, obviously, to everybody that that listened. We're all clear. We're all clear. I I couldn't (laughs) couldn't understand a word he said. (laughs) I I, I, I don't think no one could. No one could. No one could. There's bits and pieces in there, so we're going to play a fun game. We're going to play a fun game now. The last segment that you just heard does have value. It does. Okay, yes. It yes, does. Yeah, but yeah. you're going to have to play a fun game called What is Going On? <laughs> and then also, while you're playing that, yeah. uh, enjoy the fact that all of our responses were, were to things canned. that we yeah. have no idea. Yeah, we're hard. We're, I'm sweating. I, if you could see me right do you, do you see how bad I'm sweating? Do you see how bad I'm sweating? Well, I'm Look sorry, at my eyes. I'm sweating yeah. so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because everything he would say, I would have to sit and I'm trying real... I felt like I felt like an old GI coder. I'm listening to uh, I'm listening to Japanese code, and it's coming in, and I'm like, I have to tell the general what's happening, or we lose the war. Our ba- we lose our base. We lose the war. Yeah, yeah. And Thousands will die. And I'm like, okay, Daniel, you. F- Got this. <laughs> I know it hurts. I'm like, I'm like, oh, you got this, Dan. You got this. You got this. What did he say? What did he say, Dan? I'm like, okay, something. He's like talking about the swingers and the pineapples and the colors. He's talking, Luva, Luva. He's a Luva. Ha, 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 ha. And I laugh, laugh, laugh. Yeah. yeah. The, oh, I'm just, <laughs> everything. Else. It's so hard. So hard. I was like, nah. and the worst thing you could do. Like, yeah. yeah. We had also talked to his, the sweetest handler you could ever have. Uh, Martha Lynn, his his handler, had yeah. been trying to track him down. I think he was in a bad cell service. And yeah, no, no. her audio quality impacted. Well, <laughs> well, like, well, she was on <laughs> amazing. She was, she was on via Zoom. Well, it was like she was here. Well, you guys didn't get a chance to hear her, and so we talked to her. And then I also hung up on her on Zoom because I didn't have the heart to. <laughs> I couldn't look into her digital eyes. <laughs> I couldn't look into her digital yeah, eyes. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. Well, listen, we know Felipe. It's hard. Is that was a hard. Hilarious. He remembered us. 
No, he, he's super he, nice he guy. He's super hilarious. He it, was calling us from a Mexican potato. <laughs> his, his Zoom link wasn't working, no. so he had to call us from a regular. Uh, well, he has an Android tablet or Android phone. I think phone, he was on speakerphone. And he was, yeah, he was on. Spe- they're always on speaker, Tom. And then, um, it, and I uh, hate saying, and I should have said, should I have said, hey, if you don't mind, could you take us off speaker? You know what it was? Why don't we do that? I'm a, you know, I'm a pussy. No, because I think we we're like maybe it will will change. No, but that's not how, that's like you know that's like not protesting and waiting for the world to change, John Mayer. You can't. You gotta act. You gotta act. You can't wait for the world to change. I know I can't understand anything you're saying now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on, Dan. You got this. Dad, lock it in. Dan, you got it. The country depends on it. What did Felipe Asparza <laughs> just say? <laughs> I'm thinking. Oh, God. You, Dan, you got this. You got this. What is he talking about? He said your couch. Your couch is gold. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. You got a gold couch. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard, man. It's hard. It's hard. It, this is yeah, the yeah. stuff. And then people go like, and then I come home, and they're like, oh, all you do is sit in your stupid studio and talk to your dumb celebrity friends about yeah, their yeah. dumb job. And, and you make jokes with your friend. You're making you know. jokes with your dumb business friend. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Was it hard today? Well, I just pooped my pants a little bit. <laughs> and as it was happening, I was thinking to myself, I was like, all right. Uh, Tom, get it together here. Uh, you know that no one can understand what's going on. <laughs> you know but that. How did we fi- how do we, but how do I fix it? I'm thinking, how do I fix it? But did I you hear me? I was running. No. Okay, so there was a split second in there. You'll notice. Let's go back to the game. Okay, yeah. You'll notice during the game, I'll I'll drop the, his I'll drop his audio down just a little bit, and he will get a better for just like maybe a half a second, yeah, yeah. but then not good enough. And then, I, and then I have to push it back up, and then it gets overdriven crazy, and it sounds crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was like, so what should we do? Should we say, like, hey, Felipe, I'm sorry. We can't understand anything. Do you want to know what I chose to do? <laughs> so, well, I know what we chose. Do you want to know what I chose we to do? We chose to do, do you nothing. Do know what I chose to do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I chose to do what every other radio host does, <laughs> <laughs> and I chose to ignore it. Because <laughs> that's what everybody else you does. You chose the very good. <laughs> yeah, I chose the very good. Nobody else like looks at it as like, hey, we can't do this. we got to set some standards for audio around here. This isn't going to fly. <laughs> yeah, or like because I looked at like if I told Felipe, Who's a very uh, he's super nice? The awesome chat room is calling me out. They're like, Dan tried to, a couple times to end it. No, I tried to plug because there's nothing worse than a mumbling monster. And people are like, Well, what is this? At least I'll get the plug out, and then I get like you can get the tickets here. Here are the tickets. Get them. Buy them. Help! 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 We know you can't understand what's <laughs> happening, but here's the ticket for it. Yeah, at least yeah. I, fig- I, I figured if I yell the ticket link, <laughs> that they'll be like, oh, it's a mumbling monster. Yeah. And th- this is the monster. And then when I do see Dan trying to end it, I'm like, you're, you're not you're ending it. You're not ending it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, then I'm like, I'm going yeah, back. I'm going to ask like, him I have more extra, questions. I have an extra large question for you. <laughs> I've got Two one, extra one. large. <laughs> i got a long, what I like to call a grand brain for you. <laughs> I've got a large three-part Grant Britain for you, sir. <laughs> I know I just said no more long questions, but I'm doing it again. And I'm doing it, too, and then you're going to answer <laughs> with something no one can understand. And then the worst part, Actually, you know the worst part I feel bad about, and uh, I feel it's important to point this out. It's important to point this out and be God. real to our audience. Uh, okay. We don't lie to you guys, but it, I, I'm going to tell you, I have to say this. We were not lying to you guys when Felipe would say things that we didn't understand, and we would go, <laughs> and we'd fake well, that's laugh. what you do. That's you fake that. laugh. That's what I did, used to do with a nanny. She'd tell me something. I just laugh uncontrollably. Give me your nanny fake laugh. No, hold on, I'll do it. <laughs> that's pretty good, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, oh, oh. very good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, god okay. damn it. Uh, yeah. Well he's super funny uh, First yeah. time in Europe yeah, That doesn't yeah. matter to you <laughs> That doesn't matter to you yeah, because yeah, you're yeah. North American <laughs> Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, But you can see him at uh, Hard Rock yeah, 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 yeah. And our good friend Leah Set that up yeah, Thanks yeah. to also our very new good friend 
uh, Martha Lynn, who yeah, uh, the publicist. We tried hard for you, Martha. Yeah, yeah. We we but we dropped the ball on that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, those things happen. Um, I don't know what other professionals do when there's bad audio. Well, okay, so we're running without. Uh, you know, also I appreciate Felipe pointing out the fact that we we're. Uh, he's like, hey man, where are the funny people from your show? <laughs> 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 we're the guys that used to say something funny because <laughs> we're because we were freaking out. Is it? Was it apparent that we were freaking out that much? Well, were we not being funny? Well, we, how could we be funny? Yeah, when, nothing to react. We, I didn't know what you're saying. <laughs> Now, once we get to the point where someone uh, we have no idea what the, or, our guests are saying, and we can be funny, that's where we, oh, that's your motto. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, where yeah, we If, we, if we reach that, they were Doctor Manhattan. <laughs> then we're seeing where you could have a conversation with someone where you can't understand what they're saying, but and you can still funny. react. Yeah, yeah, yeah. React to what though? Oh my oh, god! Yeah. All right. Also, I want to give you guys a, a, a little secret. Tom and I vowed that when these things happen. That we will always, from now on, we'll always come back and bring you into it. <laughs> <Didn't> <laughs> we yeah, 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 we oh, did yeah, say yeah. that. We said that's the only way we can save it is we get to bring you. Like you're coming with us, and we're gonna bring you in. <laughs> we'll tell you what uh, yeah. you just witnessed. Yeah, you're in. So you, 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 and while it's happening, you're like they're gonna talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, oh, this I know. What this, <laughs> I know. What <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we'll be right back. Welcome to a corporate time with Tom and Dan. I'm Tom. I am Dan, and we are really, really excited. We're live on YouTube and Twitch right now. We have a guest, Tom. Shall we? Yep, he has an exhibit currently right now through Orlando Museum of Art. Uh, you can go to omart.org yeah. uh, for tickets for this event coming up November seventh. We got to well, we went too fast because we were just kind of doing a, a preview. Yeah, yeah, but we did get to see it, and it's the world's first. Uh, skateboard exhibit in a museum. In a real uh, in yeah, the, yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. And on the line with us right now is the most famous skateboard photographer in the world. Yes, Grant Britton. How you doing, Grant? Good. Thanks, Tom and Dan. Did you know that when we talk to AI, Google, or anything, when we say most famous skateboarding photographer, that you're the guy? Did you know that? It didn't say oldest. No, no, it didn't. <laughs> it did. And you know what? I will make you feel a little bit better. I heard you say on Hawk versus Wolf that your all of your hair on your calves is blown out. I too have no more hair on my calves, so we are probably close to the same age. <laughs> so you are in good company here. You're in a safe space. No, I I think I'm older than you. Maybe by a bit, but you know what? I haven't done as many amazing accomplishments. So let's dig in a little bit, Tom. Thanks. So Grant, um, as we went through the Museum of Art and saw the Push exhibit. Yeah, congratulations again, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Phenomenal, and on the book. Thank you. Um, but what struck me is that when I'm looking at your photography, uh, I, f- I forgot because of now in 2024, I feel like photographs are taken for granted because it's so easy that everybody has a phone Cell everybody phone. has filters everybody has everything there's a you know and i i'm looking at the exhibit and the photos in the exhibit and i um, i feel like a sense of value and how valuable they are and how valuable they were they did feel precious yeah. did they not yeah and, and and i was like this is it's it's awesome to remember how valuable photography was and well, during that time. Well, and I also would like to add to what Tom's saying. It felt like you were very much an extremely important American historian. Okay. Um. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, but seriously, you're like you're yeah. you're taking photos of things that for like those of us that grew up enjoying skateboarding and and knowing what it meant to the you know that freedom or or watching the or idolizing you know like the Pal Peralta guy you know the gang there i mean it it, it was yeah. e- extremely important how do you how do you look a- upon your photos the the ones that you were taking when they were no longer digital images when you were actually using film were they more precious to you then yeah well we didn't know any better you know that's all there was and we didn't know that anybody would care you know 40 40 years down the road um, I was just shooting the people around me. I worked at the skate park and, and I didn't even know, I wouldn't even call it documenting anything. You know, I was just shooting my friends and, you know, 
there was no job as skate photographer back then. And, and, uh, you know, it, I just did what I did, you know, I was there and, and I liked photography, skateboarding. I never shot a photo until skateboarding. And that's how I learned how to shoot. Cause yeah. I worked at the park. I just borrowed a camera and started shooting and, and kind of learned along the way. And then, you know, after about a year and a half, I, changed my art major to photography and and took every photography class it, i could take just trying to figure shit out yeah kind of it, and you're like um, oh no you're fine you're fine and you're you're basically self-taught right like you borrowed a friend's camera and then kind of went and started photoing you know just taking photos yeah i just looked at photos that were in the other magazines at the time you know skateboarder magazine and there was another magazine and i'd I'd see the skate photographers come in to, you know, I was serving Cokes and working the pro shop at the at Del Mar Skate Ranch and, and just kind of watching those guys and like, that's kind of a cool thing. They, they cruise in and then, you know, it would take two months before you ever saw the photo in a magazine. And then, yeah, I just borrowed my roommate's camera. He loaded the film for me. That's crazy. And, and uh, I asked what to do, and he goes, well, just match the exposure needle and make sure the sun's behind you. And I shot one roll, and the sh- that that photo's in my book, actually, and in the, in, in the show at um, Orlando uh, Museum of Art. And I just got stoked on it. And then I think about a year and a half later, I went with a friend of mine into the dark room at Palomar College, where I went, and... That moment that I saw one of my negatives, you know, I had never printed anything, really. I'd print. I didn't have any money to print stuff, so I had all these negatives and slides. And, and, you know, we went into the dark room, and I just went, oh, my God, this is – it's totally magical if you've ever been in the dark room. I I have, actually. I I got to do – I'm like, I think I'm one of the last – of my generation where at Deland High School here in Florida, we had the, the quintessent. I would go in there and I'd use the, the, all the different chemicals, the stop bath and everything. And I would, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And, but you're right. It was like getting to, to actually blow up your photos on photo paper and then watching them come to life. The process is truly mm-hmm. way more magical yeah. than it, it could be in a phone. And you always remember that smell yeah. too. Years later, if you've ever gone into another dark room, you go, oh, wow, there's that smell. I, um, you know, it's one of yeah. those smells you can never get rid of. Yeah, for sure. Know. Well, Grant, It's like a bar. It's a bar smell, but it's chemicals. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I, I also thought it was really cool when we were researching you. I, I thought it was so cool that you borrowed a camera to go do you know, your first photos. And to me, there's nothing truly more artistic than like, you didn't even have a drum set. You didn't even have a guitar. You know what I mean? Like you just Mm -hmm. grabbed it and then just went and kind of threw just your creative eyes on it. And, and and so like, so you added like learning F stops and you know, how to like frame photo. Mm -hmm. Like you learned that later. Yeah, it was, it was just, I did everything kind of willy nilly and, and uh, just, I did not know f stop shutter speeds i just I'd kind of figure out stuff you know back in those days you couldn't just look at the display and see you know how your photo looked. You had to wait a couple of days and get it back you know from the lab and then you'd go, "What the hell did I do here? I can't <laughs> figure out what I did wrong and then then I'd ask you know a f- photographer friend or whatever I'd kind of peek over the shoulder of one of the the better guys at the time and and uh just kind of figure it out but the it took a lot longer now you just look on youtube or you know you can you know i mean you can find it everywhere it's it's it's, i look on youtube to find out how to do stuff i don't know how to do yeah like we do the same thing yeah we do exactly the same thing here well grant i'm like going back to like my original question and i kind of got ahead of myself but you you mentioned like developing the photos and then seeing what they were after uh, you know a while after you took them so so you kind of you take using film is so much different and and it seems like so much more tangible and then finite Mm -hmm. because if you didn't get the shot you know it you know there wasn't uh, a digital camera where you could take five thousand high well, res photos. It wasn't photos. unlimited. Like, yeah, like yeah, you, yeah. you had a rule, yeah. right? Didn't you? Didn't you shoot in in twenty? Like you, you would only do like twenty roll sessions, right? Oh, um, I talked about that in an interview. Yeah, I, I think. think. You, I, yeah. Well, that was that was shooting sequences. 
especially through the 90s when everything was super technical yeah. and, and i think i think skaters are more um they're more consistent nowadays but in when street skating was coming up and it got super technical you know i i kind of had a 20 f- roll limit because you're you get about three sequences on each roll and sometimes you'd run out they'd make the one that you ran out of film on which was a, a bummer, you know. It, now it's just all digital, and you can just do it over and over again. And I, I think skate photography is a lot easier now. It's easier for me. Uh, it's also kind of made me a little lazy, and I can, I can just do a session and go. Well, it's not optimum, but I'll, I'll, I'll fix it up in you know Photoshop. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, again, using I like the aspect that you're just using more of your creativity to just kind of do it, mm-hmm. do it your own way. Uh, Grant, I'm curious, to, because as you uh, get further on into your career with taking uh, pictures of uh, skateboarders and you help, uh, uh, you know, build Transworld yeah. uh, Skateboard Magazine and, and your your photographs are in these magazines, I imagine that, and this may be a longer question, I'm sorry, our listeners make fun of me for long questions, but... Um, we are known for that. The, uh, like, you, you take more extreme... Dream uh, pictures of these skateboarders, and then I, I'm, and then you like those pictures, the the more extreme ones probably you mean get the it's more pushing the sport. Yeah, pushing. Yeah, yeah. Where you get just huge acid drops and these huge verts and Big stuff. Big airs. And, yeah. And then, uh, and this is what I'm curious about because I imagine that uh, there was a time where. Um, everybody looks at it and like, oh, the more extreme the picture, the more attention it gets, which is good for everybody. But I imagine that you are, you get motivated to take more and more extreme pictures, but maybe that it's impossible to land this trick, but the picture looks cool in a still. Ah, I see what you're but, saying. but they, they, maybe this acid drop is just impossible to land, but it's, it makes for a cool cover photo. But is there any like, Back then, is there any morality to you like, mean, like the a, a rules code of taking of, a, a skateboarding photo? Of like, hey, this yeah. trick what is impossible to land, so we shouldn't make it the cover of. I a see mag- what you're you know, saying. Was, yeah. was there anything like that? Yeah, well, there's a general rule in skate photography: is you don't run anything. Say somebody goes and does a trick and they don't make it, but you shot stills. Yeah, and you can't use that still until they actually make it. So you might, and it's usually they have it on video to back it up. And then, you know, he might be wearing different things. It might be on a different day, but, you know, he made it and it made for a good still. You know, one of the, um, you know, I have a, a photo of Jamie Thomas doing the leap of faith. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, he's dropping off a 17 foot, you know, building, you know, second story. And he didn't make it, and I shot a sequence of it, and we showed the sequence, too. And he, he goes right through the middle of his board, so it's kind of considered the biggest bail ever, you know, that was used. It was used as a poster for foundation skateboards. But, um, yeah, but I used the still of it because it looks it looks bitching, you know, yeah, it's it looks cool. so great. You but know? this, but this, and, are we co- correct in thinking that the sequence, as long as the sequence shows what actually happened, mm-hmm. then it's fine. Yeah. You just don't want I mean, to bail. Bail sequences are cool too. They you are. Know, I love bail. Bail shots are, I have some great bail shots, you know, but it's, they're obvious bails, you know, do you, because you've taken so many photos and because you've done this at the highest level for so long and because, you know, obviously with Tony and everything, do you lose a lot of media? Like, is it hard to organize the amount of media that you have? And, and I'm guessing somewhere along the line, you probably yeah. switched from using film to digital or, or how does that work? Well, I, I use digital for almost everything now i use film for my art stuff and portraits and landscapes and things like that just for fun you know i have i have a leica and you know i and a hasselblad that i shoot and uh i just um yeah it's hard to organize it's it's a nightmare sometimes because it was a nightmare before because it's all slides and negatives you know i've got a garage full of file cabinets and flat files and and then you know i'm right behind me i think you can see you know there's five drawers full of slides from the 80s and the 90s 
And uh, and now with digital, it's even crazier, you know, because if you don't you don't name something or stick it in a certain folder and name it, it might just have a serial number on it. And I lose it takes me as long to find a digital file sometimes as it does, you know, going through a whole, you know, drawer full of uh, of a file cabinet. I kind of like I kind of just go, OK, where was it again? Or you'll pull <laughs> something out. Say you'll go into a contest from 1986 and you pull out one photo of a guy and then you don't put it back, you know, after you're done with it. Or, I mean, it's just it can become a nightmare. I'm working on a Tony Hawk book right now, a big coffee table book with uh, Genesis Publications in London. And uh, they do a lot of music. You know, they've done Bowie books, Rolling Stones and, you know, Bruce Lee and all these really big coffee table collector books and i had four big tubs full of tony hawk stuff and then i've got it down to one tub now but now i got to figure out you know i'm thinking what does tony want to see what do people want to see sure. what do i want to see what does the publisher want to see so yeah it's it's <clears throat> always you know just an organizational nightmare yeah, oh, I bet. And that stuff, does it deteriorate? Do you have to, like, keep it a certain way, or is it pretty hardy? Uh, no, it's film is pretty stable. You know, slides, especially Kodachrome and stuff that I shot in the 80s is super stable. As long as it's not uh, in the light, and, you know, I keep it pretty dark and try to keep it cool. And, gotcha. and But then you have digital, you have hard drives crashing, and... You know, all the stuff that's on CD and DVD, and then you can't open a file, you know, because it's a 20-year-old DVD, right. you know. And the software doesn't work or something. Yeah, yeah. We've had compatibility issues. stuff. But back in the day, you had to send out, you know, somebody, you know, like Time Magazine or somebody, Sports Illustrated, would ask for photos. And uh, they didn't, they always return stuff, but you'd send stuff out, you know, original stuff, and never get it back. Or... You get something printed in the magazine and, you know, in the early days, we were just like, oh, it got in the magazine. Cool. And then you wouldn't even think about the original. Oh, I never got the original back. So there's like the cover of McGill doing the McTwist. I don't have that photo. I have other ones from the session that he made. But not that. I don't have that exact photo. And you're just like, you know, you're just so stupid, you know, (laughs) back when you're, you know, I was in my 20s, you know, in early 30s and. And you don't think skateboarding is, you know, going to even last, you know, you all do this for a while. And, you know, I ended up at Transworld for 20 years and then wow. did the we did the skateboard mag, the other skateboard mag in, you know, we I was there for 14 years or whatever. So, yeah, that's impressive, well, man. Uh, Grant, I want that's what I kind of wanted to talk to you about is when is this a long question. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, our listeners are going to like oh, being made fun of that. Oh. <laughs> this short question. Yeah, Grant's got the goods. They're oh. going to love that so much. When did you see the... I just might forget it. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I apologize, Grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going to lose it. Well, like no, I, I, I said I was old. So. <laughs> when, when did you see the money start coming in? And when did you see the potential for uh, like skateboarding to blow up as popular yeah. well, as it like, did? Effectively, like, he made his own career. What, what were some of the tells back then? Um, well, skateboarding, you know, it just went up and down, you know, like in the I started working at Del Mar in 78 and by 79, it was dead. Skateboarding was dead. Wow. It went from, you know, 100 people in the skate park to two people in the skate park, you know. And you started and, photographing um, Tony around 1980, right? Yeah. The first time the my oldest photos are of Tony are 1980, 80. Yeah, 80. God. And uh yeah, so every few years, it kind of went with the economy. It went with real estate. I mean, real estate got expensive in in uh, California, especially, and uh, and nobody had money to start skate parks. Insurance went way up. You know, it, it went from I think we paid at the skate park they paid eleven thousand a year for for insurance, and then it went to a hundred thousand a year. I mean, in a few years. Nuts, so, yeah. yeah, it was it was nuts. But every few years it would go up and down. And then in the 
There was a boom in the late 80s. And then there was another. We went from, I forget how many pages we were at Transworld, but we went down to 76 pages at one time. I mean, thin, paper yeah. thin. And then it got as high as 400 and something pages. It looked like Vogue magazine or something. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Buying, you know, they were buying a dozen pages of ads. And, you know, when it was really booming, then skaters could start to make some money. That, you know, Tony and, you know, Christian, whoever, you know, they were making good royalties. And then it, and then it crashed again. So it was just every few years. The difference now is that there's the Internet. Um, skate companies aren't doing very well right now. Skateboarding is booming, but shops and hard goods are tanking, you know? I mean, and then you've got, you know, people making stuff, you know, overseas, and, right. and it's it's really a hard business to be in, you know? And there's, you know, probably, you know, 20 skaters making good money. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, it's like as one of the rarest me, sports, yeah. Yeah, as far as me making money it was like at first you know i didn't make anything for years and then when we started trans world i was i think i was getting 200 dollars a month you know i was still working at the skate park and then slowly we built it up you know where we'd shoot something for vision or pal and then the rates we started to kind of we were able to move the rates you know photography rates up and then you get 50 bucks a photo and you were stoked you know, but then you'd still be fighting to get that check for, you know, fifty dollars, you know, sent to you. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. But, yeah. But, of course. What, like, do you remember the time like when like Tony Hawk Pro Skater came out? And because that's I, I grew up in the 90s skateboarding and then, Me too. Uh, and the, you know, so I'm uh, 42. So that uh, that time when Tony Hawk Pro Skater came out and just it was a phenomenon and it was gigantic and it was like. It seemed like skateboarding, uh, X Games, yeah. skateboarding was more popular than ever. And yeah, you got to be a part of all of that. Yeah, but that's that's when the skaters started to make money. Especially Tony, he was you know doing well, and I I think his his pro skater game. I mean that put skateboarding in the actual laps of everyone. You know, sure, yeah, the skate. You know, there's you know jocks and parents you know they're all playing you know the game and and they didn't know anything about skateboarding you know there were there came a time i'd see like dads wearing airwalks or something and you're going oh you got airwalks huh and he goes uh-huh yeah i got them at the mall I you know less. they didn't even know they were a skate shoe yep gotcha then. yeah 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 they didn't you yeah. know were, were, were you a little disappointed that people were like i guess borrowing from the culture but had no idea you have a, kind of a little bit of a, a, a weird appropriation. Yeah. We call those <laughs> just like a skater. posers, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, it it never really bothered me. I thought it was kind of cool in ways that they were looking at us. And you know, Madison Avenue, they always looked at skateboarding. You know, um, you know where you'd see something in a uh, commercial and the trucks were on backwards and you know things like that. And, or they're mall grabbing or whatever. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, but no, it, it never bugged me, and I I always looked at it as as long as the skaters can make a living off of it, I was stoked because they're the ones that deserve it. The skaters, you know, you know, they just, you know, they're the ones who aren't going to be able to walk someday. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, yo, you're right. You're right. That's why they make all those. Uh, I get all the uh, the ads on Facebook for all the the knee guards for old timers that like to ride. Still, they have like inserts <laughs> yeah. and knee guards and all kinds of stuff. Uh, Grant, let's talk about the fish eye lens. Yeah, because why? Like, uh, why did that become so popular in skateboarding? Oh, he's got one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, is, that's the money maker yeah. right there, right? So, wh what was it about the fish eye that uh, was perfect for skateboarding? Um, well, uh, a photographer, Warren Bolster, who was a skate photographer, he was a surf photographer first. He brought in the seventies, he brought the fish eye to skateboarding and, uh, it just became a staple where you had to shoot with a fish eye. I mean, it adds kind of a three dimensional look to it. It adds depth, you know, from foreground to background, um, you can get down low and it makes the person look higher, but it, it's just the lens that went with skating. And then, you know, it's, it's, it, 
people use it in surfing and people use it in snowboarding. Not as much in snowboarding. They use a, just a wide angle lens because they're farther away. And uh, you just kind of had to get the fisheye. When I started shooting, I couldn't afford a fisheye, so I bought a 20 millimeter lens. And it just wasn't, it was wide, but it wasn't, yeah. it didn't bend all the lines and, and, and really look like a fisheye. And then when I got a fisheye, when I started working for the magazine, uh, Larry Balma, who started the magazine, had a Pentax with a fisheye. And I used that lens too much where I was using it for portraits and, and you know, like you didn't really want to use it for portraits because it was so, if you got really close, yeah, it was, you know, really distorted. Well, like for and, me, it pulls my nose out. You yeah, know, yeah. Like, I, I right. too went through a phase everyone's of... Nose is yeah, yeah, there's a lot of uh, Tony Hawk pictures with, it looks like he has a giant hawk yeah. nose. <laughs> 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 But yeah, then I learned that, you know, I saw I carried two cameras. I had my old Minolta with a normal lens and the 20, and then I would have to switch back and forth. And then when the magazine, we started making a little money, then I was able to buy camera gear and have the, the good gear that I needed. And, and, and then when I, when I, when we started the magazine, I was already going to college and learning photography. So I was doing all the darkroom work. You know, I was printing all the photos wow. at the college and running them. You know, the lab tech there was just kind of shaking his head because they're just all this, you know, out of the dryer, there's all this, you know, skate photography coming <laughs> out. And I'm I'm running the whole magazine through the college. And I mean, I was paying for the paper, but uh, yeah. And then we built a dark, I built a dark room and I had only worked in one dark room my whole life, you know, the my whole couple of years sure. so i set it up exactly like the colleges and then i had assistants who all i tell people hey go to the palomar college and take photography and you want to take this teacher and 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 you know all these all these people that turned into photographers you know went through the same college so and through my dark room you know so you were kind of running like you know having people assist you and then they would they would just like leave the nest and start f- photoing like taking photos yeah. of, of, of skateboarding. Well, usually usually they'd start shooting for the magazine too they were hired as a darkroom person i was just trying to get people that could you know um uh print really well the way i wanted them to print yeah and not just the way they wanted to print and uh yeah i just they went through and you know it was like you know, Steve Sherman, who became a surf photographer, yeah. uh, Todd Swank, you know, was my assistant, Johnny Donhow, all these people, you know, were great photographers in their own right. And I just kind of taught them everything I knew. I've, I've always been into sharing. Even now, I, I, I try to share with kids That's and, cool. you know, I sit on some advisory boards at, at the college and a couple of high schools and, and, you know, you can't live forever. You got to share it. You know, you can be selfish, but you know what good is that? I, well, I mean, you're I doing like it when with somebody. The, it, well, sorry, I, no, I was going to say. Like when, go ahead. I like when somebody says in an interview. You know, they say something good. You know, that I taught them a bunch of stuff. You know, I feel, I feel warm and fuzzy inside. You know. Yeah. Well, it's a good feeling to do that. Plus, I mean, you're sharing your art in the exhibit. You know, at the museum, you're sharing the book. You're working on the book, the 300 page book with Tony. Yeah. You're uh, you're sharing your knowledge with kids and with being on the advisory boards and stuff like that. And by the way, Grant will be signing books and posters after the event. Uh, that's with all tickets, yep. and there are still tickets available for the Grant Britton and Tony Hawk yep. uh, conversation that they're going to have. Come hang out with us. We're going to be yeah, there. we're going to be there yeah. watching it. Um, it. Grant, I with just seeing how long you've been. Uh, taking pictures of skaters, and it, it it dawned on me the amount of time you've had to wait around skate parks and wait mm. and and uh, I was so for someone to accomplish, uh, accomplish a trick like where he got kicked out of. You know, I'm sure he's been, <laughs> but well, skateboard photographer. I just imagine you've been kicked out of places a lot. I mean, it just seems like it goes with the territory. Yeah, yeah, it gets old after a while. I, bet. I did. <laughs> When I hit 50, I think I quit shooting street skating if it wasn't permitted. Mm. Like, if it wasn't like, yeah, I just got tired of getting hassled by cops, uh, (laughs) well-meaning citizens, uh, storefront, you know, store owners, just, you know, just people walking by and they just want to, you know, 
put their two cents in, you know, like, and you're just like, why are you talking to me? You know? <laughs> yeah, why, why are you upset that yeah, uh, I'm, I'm riding on this bench in the city? You just move along, yeah, please. Yeah, I'm <laughs> taking pictures of my friends having uh, fun. But, but Grant, well, the, the, and then yeah. one thing, skate photographers, where the skaters take off when the cops get there and skate photographers are stuck there with their gear and their light. <laughs> you know? I didn't think about that, but you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you're, not, you're not the one climbing over the fence. You're the one going, trying to figure out how to talk your way out of it. Right. You know? <laughs> exactly. But, but it also, like, skate, like, if you show me someone that's good at skateboarding, I will show you a super determined individual that's insanely hardworking because there's no, there's no way to cheat your way into no. being a good skater like you have to put in the insane amount of time and work and i just thought of like the the uh, the, your sessions that these skaters were like all right one more time one more time and then you're sitting there for 18 hour or like just an insane amount of time trying to uh photograph this one trick i was just wondering and like back in the day is there any like record amount of time that you wait until someone uh actually accomplished something um yeah, it's it could be a couple hours of shooting, you know, and that's if you're throwing yourself down a rail, you know, yeah, you know, a twenty stair handrail, and you're slamming on everyone, you're taking a beating, you know. You're by the end, you're bloody, and you know, I've been on sessions where people broke something, and I or people, I had to take people to the hospital and oh, stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's you know, or they're dirty, you know. You'll see shots. I used to kind of like it when you'd see somebody's clothes and their back, if they're wearing a white T-shirt and their back's just black from landing on the pavement. You know, I I, I, I feel sorry for them. But as long as they want to do it, I'm there. I have the easy job. I just get to shoot the photos. Yeah. But it's like, man, are you going to make it? And you're like, or you'd go to a session and they break their board on the first time. You know, and then, okay, I just drove to L.A. and oh. he didn't bring another board, you know. So, you know, the two-hour drive and, you know, you'd go out, you'd go out on the weekends a lot. And, when, like I said, I quit shooting skate, street skating when I hit 50 because I had kids and everything. And I didn't have any weekends. Every weekend I was out shooting. You know, I wasn't hanging at home drinking beer. I was, you know, I was up you know, in LA or, or shooting, you know, just a skater trying to trick, you know, 50 times or a hundred times, you know, and sometimes you'd get it or I had to go reshoot things, you know, in the film days, once in a while, you'd have to go reshoot, you know, something because you blew it, you know, you, you, you didn't do, you know, you, like night shot guy shows up, he's got black clothing on, and it's a black background, right? You know, and you're just like, "Holy crap! How am I gonna? <laughs> yeah. How am I gonna light this thing?" And I think the most I ever did were, was three times. I had to go back and shoot something. That's so, actually for you know one time. That's not that bad, man. <laughs> I mean, for for well, someone going and not necessarily having everything orchestrated like a. It's not like a fashion photo shoot. It's not like the clothes are here, the models here. Yeah, you all we have to do is pose you, and we have unlimited. You know, it was. It's not like that. Uh, well, you know, the Orlando thing, um, when I went to Orlando in 83 and we shot the Burdines, you know, Fashion Square. Yeah, we were talking about that uh, yeah. a, a little bit. That before. was, yeah, that was middle of the night, you know, and it was a bust. And we'd wait and we'd see the security guys' lights come down at the end of the building and we'd all go hide in the bushes. And... And, you know, it's like 12 o'clock at night, and I don't know if the photos are coming out, you know. I didn't know, and I still had to go home, you know, back to California and and develop the film. And we were we were on a little trip, you know. We went from St. Pete. Uh, no, we went to um, Jack's yep. to uh, St. Pete and then up to Orlando. So, you know, we were out there for like a, a week or whatever, and you're sitting with all this film in your bag, and hopefully you don't lose it. Hopefully x-rays, you know, at the right. airport don't mess it up. And so you just never knew what you did. When I shot the chin ramp thing, it's like, I didn't know. I knew it was special because the ramp was the first of its kind, you know, sure. where it was a combination ramp and, you know, it had a spine and everything. But I'm just going, God, I hope these are good. Yeah. You know, and because... 
I mean, Pal, they, you know, Stacy Peralta, you know, he uh, he picked me to shoot it, and then Mofo at Thrasher, he got to shoot the the Hawaii stuff and the um, Pink Motel stuff, and I I got the chin ramp, and I was just when I got the photos back, I just went, oh my god, these are amazing, you know, I did everything right, and then even now, the advantage of digital now is I can fix up old photos that might have been underexposed or overexposed, I can fix them up in Photoshop. And I, I've been showing a lot of new photos that never got seen because of technology. You it's know, crazy now. that you can go in there and, and use stuff that maybe you took 20 years ago, and then like you've never had the ability to, like let's just say, remove one thumb or a smudge or a, yeah. a paper cup that rolled into the... I don't know. Just I'm just thinking yeah. of it. And you can go in there and, and salvage all of this. That's That's incredible, man. But I'm able to I'm able to open stuff up that was two stops, you know, underexposed gotcha. that I couldn't use back then, and then I'm able I'll shoot a uh, I'll copy it in a raw file. This is pretty nerdy, yeah, but, yeah. And then I can just open it up in Photoshop and see all the detail in the shadows, and just you know, the only thing you can't do in in well, I think in anything is to like editorial style photography is make people look higher than they really are and and stuff like that. Right. But if there's a poll that bothers me, I'll take out a poll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> you know, yeah. So. As long as you're not doctoring what the actual skate trick is, I think you're fine. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. Grant, you're I not lying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, no, no. it's a lie. Exactly. Well, well speaking of that, uh, I think when if you tell someone skateboard photography, their immediately their mind goes to all action shots. Right. Everything right. is action shots, and through the exhibit, I know. So there's some non oh, like, uh, stereotypical action shots. There's some powerful non action shots. The, and I'm curious mm -hmm. to what some of your favorite non action shots are because some of them really just show, like you said, the, the grittiness of someone trying a trick hundreds of times and being exhausted and they're just standing there holding their skateboard, looking at the just rail. Thinking. Yeah, yeah. And it's super powerful. And I'm just curious if you have a favorite. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really drawn. I love portraiture. Portraiture is my favorite thing, and I think I got into that when I started to college and and looking at non skate photographers and you know Irving Penn and Avedon and people like that, where I was just like really drawn to where you can see the kind of see the soul of someone just in their face and their eyes, and and you know the the Tony Hawk sitting in the pipe. You know that was when. Nobody knew who Tony Hawk was. Yeah. We knew who Tony Hawk was. We were at a session at a local ditch here, and, and I was with other Del Mar locals, and we were just shooting. And then we were right, he was riding through that pipe, and it goes under the freeway, the I 5, as we say, the I 5. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then at the end of the tube, you know, at the end of the pipe, I was like, hey, sit there for a minute on your board and let me get a picture. And, Back then, everybody was like, why? Why do you want to shoot a shot of my photo or my face? Yeah, yeah. And, but I'm just doing my nerdy photo thing, you know, photographer's thing. And, you know, I just love those stuff like that because it just, it, it shows an era, you know, just the shoes he's wearing and the board he's riding and how young he yeah. is. His and, hair, the way his hair is, is yeah, cut. The yeah, the flop and, and. Yeah. And then the photos, you know, at Del Mar, um, the sticker toss that's in the book, um, you know, where it's, you know, 50 people in the bottom of the pool fighting over stickers and T-shirts and things like that. That's 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 when it started was, you know, I think the first sticker toss I ever saw might have been at Kona in Jacksonville. Oh, what a and, legendary place. And, Kona. Yeah. Pros started throwing stickers and shirts and I I hadn't really seen it before then, you know, sticker tosses. And then the one at, at Tahoe that's in the book, you know, the Tahoe contest where it's just mayhem, you know, where people are bloodied, you know, from fighting over stuff and boards. And somebody threw a dead cat out on the 
ram. You got to do it. Sometimes yeah. you got to throw a dead cat. Where'd they get a dead cat yeah. from? <laughs> it was insane. And you're just going, what is going on here? You know, I know we're crazy, but this is nuts. Well, you know? Why was a dead cat laying around? Why not? <laughs> I don't know. It was out in the forest. Well, you know, that's the same. I think it was that contest where Lance, Lance Mountain told me he was going to set his board on fire. He whispered to me, hey, Grant, I'm going to put my board, set my board on fire. And I'm like, what? We're standing out in the middle of a, a forest, you know, in Tahoe. And he rode his board on fire, you know, and I got the shot of him doing a like a um, tail slide, tail bonk with his board on fire. And, you know. That's when stuff was real back then. Yeah. I you loved know? Lance Mountain. He was my favorite. Yeah, you know? and a few hundred people, you know, witnessed it. And and you're going to have thousands saying that they were there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Exactly. Are, are Grant, I guess my last question, and again, uh, Grant Brenton and Tony Hawk are going to be at the Orlando Museum of Art yes, November 7th. Uh, you can get tickets, uh, TomandDan.com. Use promo code TomandDan, and, and you'll get free entry into the museum to go see the yeah. Push exhibit. And they also got a really cool punk rock exhibit and a bunch of other stuff yeah, at the museum. You could make it an amazing day of it. The uh, chat room, we just threw the, the link in the chat room, omart.org, if you want to uh, you know, scoop up those tickets. And uh, so th- my question to you, known Tony since he was a kid, what do you think the difference uh, with him was and what caused him to become mm. uh, so great at skateboarding, so uh, infamous, uh, such a... Po- we, we, me and Daniel were talking like pop culture icon of our generation. Um, w- what do you think the difference between him and other skaters were? Well, Tony's like a lot of skaters where they just live for it. They just want to make one trick. It's always about that next trick. You know, they just, they do that trick a hundred times. And, you know, back then, people like Neil Blender and, and Lance were also cartooning. And they would draw pictures of tricks that didn't even exist and then go out and try to do them, you know. Oh, wow. um, but, crazy. yeah, Tony's like all skaters where... They're obsessed, you know, with making that one trick. You know, you'll watch a kid l- try to learn how to u- learn a, a, a kick flip, you know, on flat ground. And they do it hundreds of times until they they make it. And then I've seen people cry when they finally make a trick, you know, where they're just, you know, blown away that they made it. And it's they... I don't know. Sometimes they're too hard on themselves. Yeah. You know, you got to remember it's fun, too. Yeah. And uh, but Tony was just he just lived for it. It was his. It was something he was good at. And because of his body, the way he was built and everything, he was made fun of. You know, he got body shamed back in those days and bullied. and, And then you're a skater. It wasn't cool to be a skater. It was cool to be a football player or a basketball player. You know, ball sports are okay, but you can't ride a skateboard. You know, it's and nobody thought that he would be anything. And we didn't even know, you know, because yeah. you're like skateboarding is going to. We just thought, oh, skateboarding is going to die again, and we'll have to find something else to do. And then they bulldoze the skate parks all over the United States and the world, and then people started street skating. And they started building ramps in their backyards. Back, yeah. And it was a DIY thing. And they're still doing the DIY thing. Who are building the skate parks now? They're all skaters. Yeah. The good skate park builders are, you know, somebody like Tim Payne. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We, we have people, uh, we know uh, Jenna Hurt, a very good buddy of ours, goes and builds uh, skate parks with Tim Payne. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the, he's the yeah, guy. And, Team Payne's the, yeah. the team. It all starts in the 80s, you know, when skaters, skaters took over. They took over the industry. You know, you got a Rocco, whatever you think of Steve, but everybody started buying their own con, you know, their own um, companies. And, and, you know, skaters just kind of take over. They're creative. You know, they're all artists and musicians and photographers and dancers. And, you know, there's so much creativity in in skateboarding. And, And then with, you know, with the Olympics and all that, you know, a lot more girls are skating. A lot more women are skating now. I mean, it's amazing. There's a there's a thing coming up on the second and third here 
in Encinitas at Poods Park and it's exposure and it's a women's event and it's been going on for years, probably like 10 years. Wow. And there's, there's women skaters that there weren't a lot of women skating in the eighties, but now there's, you know, there's standouts at the skate park. Well, you know, Grant, they're really, really good. I, yeah. I feel like you are responsible for a small part of this. Yeah, well, helping because, getting the message to us, yeah, right? Because if there wasn't these uh, these photographs that were in these magazines, somebody had to every, document it. You know that uh, that people saw that it, that it wouldn't have been as you know, or be as popular as it is now and well known. And and I'm sure you realize like now, and you've said before at the time you didn't know how important it was but now and especially with this exhibit and when you walk through and you see these iconic photographs yeah, and some of them are before, humongous yeah. like they're just full walls it's awesome and, man. and you're like you uh, helped push the marketing of skateboarding globally yeah well it might be too big now where there's so much content that you don't you just don't you lose it you know it's fleeting you know it's like Back in the day, it was you do a photo, ends up on the cover, and then everybody remembers it 40 years down the road. Now you'll see stuff on Instagram, things I see by a lot of different photographers. And I go, this could have been a cover back, you know, even 15 years ago. This could have been a cover. And then you see it for 10 minutes and then it's gone and everybody's, you know, forgotten about it, you know, which is sad. And there's just this high demand for content from everyone and every different medium that you, things are just lost and wasted. So yeah. you won't remember certain things that are important things now. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty crazy. A lot of stuff and, being and, pumped out. And that's sure. why I started, like, started with, you see the push exhibit, you realize the value yeah. of your photography that is lost now. It does sort of reframe now. your brain yeah. a little bit. Yeah, 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 it yeah. does. Well, Grant, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We really appreciate it. We're looking forward to uh, seeing you and Tony Hawk yeah. have a conversation at the Museum of Art again. Congrats on the exhibit. Congrats on the book. Uh, I can't wait to see both again, at least the exhibit again. Yeah, and I think there's I think there's a lot of general admission. Uh, the regular tickets okay. are still available. I think there's two VIP tickets left. So if anybody's thinking about getting go. the the crazy ticket, you might want to get on it yeah, now. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I was going to mention the two, but I also was going to call my buddy who mentioned that he really wanted oh. to go. <laughs> They'd be like, "Hey, dude, get on! There's two left." Uh, but yeah, Sorry, g- g- get the it. get now get the nah, general admission good. tickets, and again, use promo code Tom and Dan so you can get uh, admission into the Museum of Art and uh, see the Push exhibit and all the great exhibits yeah. at the museum. It's truly amazing. Hey, congrats again, and thank you again for the time today. We really uh, had a great time talking to you. Thanks. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yes, yep, sir. Right? We'll see you soon. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Take care. That is Grant Britton live from somewhere in, I'm assuming, California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's lived in the same town for uh, a long, long time. He's you a know, cool dude. Yeah, Just a cool. laid back, very California, right? Chill dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. We will see you next week.